Okay, it's one o'clock. I'd like to call this meeting to order. I think it's one o one. The proceedings of this meeting will be recorded and made available on the internet. And we'll move on to item 1.2 of our agenda, which is our roll call. So can we please have our clerk, Jesse Clark, please call the roll. Thank you. Mayor Lamsett, are you present? I am present. Uh, Deputy Mayor Armstrong? Present. Councillor Franson? Present. Councillor Braybrook? Present. Councillor Cadigan? Present. For staff, we have Donna Taggart, CAO Treasurer? Present. Steve Brockbank, Director of Emergency Services? Present. Dylan Kosh, Director of Recreation and Facilities? Present. Uh, Evan Grieger, Director of Public Works? Present. Barb Waldron, Director of Building and Planning, CBO? Present. Adele Arbor, Planner? Present. Sarah Dillamarter, Junior Planner? Present. Bianca Dragisevic, <laughs> Deputy Clerk? And Chelsea Carpenter, Direct Supervisor of Waste Public Works Coordinator. Present. <clears throat> and Jesse Clark, Director of Corporate Services, Clerk is present. Okay, thank you very much, Jesse. Um, it seems like we're having potentially an audio issue. Want to take a minute? Nope. Seems like it might. People are able to hear us, so I will work on it in the background. But we can okay. go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Jeffy. We can move on to item 1.3 of our agenda, which is land acknowledgements and moments of reflection. We respectfully acknowledge the Trent Lakes and Peterborough County are located on Treaty 20 Michisaugee territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisaugee and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty First Nation, which include Alderville, Beausoleil, Curve Lake, Georgina Island, Hiawatha, Rama, and Scugog Island First Nations. Trent Lakes respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they will continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We will now take a moment to reflect on these principles and our duties and responsibilities as members of council. Thank you very much. We will move on to item two of our agenda, which is the disclosure of pecuniary interest. If anyone on council has a pecuniary interest in an item on the agenda, please discuss, disclose it now or any time during the meeting prior to discussing anything on the item that you have an interest in. I don't see no hands. We can move on to item three of our agenda, and we, it is the approval of our agenda. Would anyone be care to make a motion? Let me see. Councillor Franzen for a motion to approve. And Councilor Braybrook for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. We can move on to item four of our agenda, which is the adoption of the minutes. We can adopt them all at one time, or we can pull one out to discuss any item on it. Three twos. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? The Councilor Braybrook. The motion to adopt all the minutes as uh, Do I have a seconder for that motion? I see Councilor Cadigan for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. We can move on to item five of our agenda, which is committees and boards. Do you like to discuss anything about those three items, or we can have to take them all in one motion? It's up to the council. Anyone prepared to make a motion? I see Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Go ahead. Yep, motion to adopt all of the uh, committee and board minutes. Do I have a seconder for that motion? See Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay. Now I would entertain a motion. We're moving on to section six of our agenda, which is a statutory public meeting pursuant to the Planning Act. 
I would entertain a motion to suspend our regular council meeting. I'm going to move it. See Councillor Braybrook for a mover and Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay, we are now in a public meeting. And I think we have Sarah Della Marker, our junior planner. Would you like to speak to file 7.1? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. This is a public meeting under section 34 of the Planning Act to consider an amendment to the municipality's comprehensive zoning bylaw B2014-070. A notice of public meeting for today's application containing the prescribed information was circulated to all landowners within a 120 meter radius of the subject lands at least 20 days prior to this meeting. The notice was also mailed to all prescribed agencies, public bodies, and persons in accordance with the regulations. Anyone wanting to be notified of any decision from today's public meeting must send in a written request to either myself or the clerk and the notice of passing will be mailed to them, <coughs> sending out the method and manner in which appeals may be made to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Please note that if a person does not send a written comment prior to the passing of the bylaw, or make an oral submission at a public meeting, that person may not be entitled to appeal the decision. So this is a public meeting for file number 23-07 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by agent John B.J. Messick on behalf of the property owner, Vilma Mary Ricci, for the lot located at 9 Fire Route 274. The purpose of the zoning bylaw amendment is to change the zone category of the severed parcel from the shoreline residential zone to the shoreline residential private access exception 47 zone to correct an existing encroachment on the neighboring property landowner. Neighboring property owner's land, apologize. This amendment is required as a condition of consent file B-78-21 which was approved by Council on October 21st, 2021. The subject lands, when added to the benefiting lot, will continue to have a deficient lot frontage of 41.67 metres, while the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw requires a frontage of 45 metres. There is a planning report on the agenda from the municipality's planning staff. The report states that the application is generally consistent with the provincial policy statement and growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The municipality has not received any comments from any circulated agencies or members of the public. Further, if any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission but would like to do so at this time, please either raise your hand if you're in the physical gallery or use the raise a hand feature if you're in the online gallery um so that we are able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission thank you okay thank you very much sir. okay is there anyone in the gallery virtual or real that would like to speak before or against this file seeing no hands in front of us is there anyone putting hand up okay any comments or questions from council i'm seeing no any more information from staff i see none okay that was quick we can move on wow <laughs> quite started me okay we can move on to item seven of our agenda which is business arising out of a public meeting i would entertain now a motion to reconvene our regular council meeting Councillor Cadigan for a mover, Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay, we can move on now on to 7.1, which I did say 7.1 on the last one, which was 6.1. My apologies. Sarah Bill Marker, our junior planner, would you like to speak to this file? Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. There is a public meeting held for file number 23-07. At this time, staff are recommending that Council 1 receives the report from the planning staff and 2 that Council supports the requested zoning bylaw amendment which is attached to today's agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments from Council? Is anyone prepared to make a motion? Go ahead, Councillor Braver. I'll make a motion to receive the report and also uh, approve the zoning bylaw amendment. So, stated by okay. and Mr. Moore. Seconder is Councillor Cadigan. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? 
That motion has carried. Thank you very much, Sarah. Okay, we can move on to item eight of our agenda, which is presentations. And item 8.1 is Julie Ingram, the manager of environmental health and chief building officials of part eight sewage systems, Peterborough Public Health. Could you please come ahead and take the seat and go right ahead with your presentation. Julie. Well, for you, Mr. Mayor. Hello, everybody. It's good to good to see everybody, councillors and staff as well. Um, so my name is Julie Ingram. I'm the manager of environmental health with Peterborough Public Health, and one of my responsibilities is the on-site sewage program, also known as Part 8 of the Ontario Building Code. So uh, here specifically today to give you some long pending updates on the reinspection program. Unfortunately, uh, COVID put a damper in us getting some information to you, so I'm happy to be here today, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm just controlling my own slides. I think. Um, yeah. Someone is upstairs, but we can pass over control to you if you Doesn't prefer. matter. Nope. Okay. Next slide, please. So yeah. be perfect. Thank you. Just speak to the invisible. Next yeah. slide, <laughs> Um, so as, uh, as mentioned, I am going to present to you today to provide an update uh, specifically on maintenance inspection programs that occurred in 2021 and 2022 in the municipality of Trent Lakes. I'm going to touch base on this season's reinspection program, just give a bit of a current status quo check in on that, and uh, I'll briefly touch on the future of the safe sewage program um, as delivered by Peterborough Public Health. Next slide, please. And since your meeting was moving along so well, I'm going to hold you up with some history. So <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to give the background for those of you who may not be aware of what uh, what maintenance inspections are. They're also very commonly known as reinspections. So they are uh, the authority for maintenance inspections comes from the Building Code Act and the Ontario Building Code. And there's two types of programs that have been identified. There's the mandatory maintenance inspection inspection program, as well as the discretionary maintenance inspection program. So the mandatory maintenance inspections are specifically for properties that have been identified by the Clean Water Act and for those that appear in source water protection zones. So they could be located close to a municipal wellhead or a surface water intake zone for a municipal drinking water system. There are two areas in your municipality that, uh, that apply, so it would be Alpine Village and Buckhorn Lake Estate. So we do have uh, numerous properties. I think we're at 65 now between those two areas that we inspect on a five-year cycle as mandated by the Ontario Building Code. The other type of inspection program is the discretionary maintenance inspection program. So while these programs are not provincially mandated, there is allowances in the Ontario Building Codes that these uh, programs can be established by local municipalities, lake associations, conservation associations, um, different, different organizations like that. And you do have such a program in the municipality of Trent Lakes that Peterborough Public Health does deliver. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Next slide, please. There's, uh, there's numerous benefits of septic reinspection programs. Um, while it's not a frequently researched area, unfortunately, much to my chagrin, I wish there was a lot more data that I could share with you on that. Uh, there is some, and I've outlined some of that on this slide here, which I believe you have in front of you. So one of the key things I wanted to mention is there's no provincial database for on-site sewage systems in Ontario. Each local agency um, that has a role in this is responsible to maintain their own records. But we do know from doing some evaluation um, that evidence does show that Ontario, in Ontario, about 70% of systems that are between the ages of 7 to 15 years are failing, and 55% of failures are attributed to poor maintenance and management of the on site sewage system. It, advanced treatment systems, which are specialized sewage systems, are mandated under the code to have a maintenance agreement in place with a service provider, and those types of sewage systems are subject to annual inspections and sampling requirements to make sure that the advanced treatment unit is doing its job and functioning well. But this only applies to a very specialized type of sewage system, which we do see in this region frequently as well. But for everything else that's in the ground, your, your typical 
you know, class four septic tank and filter bed or absorption trench bed system, there is no mandatory maintenance requirements under that. So that's where uh, these maintenance programs can fill a really big void that's in the Ontario Building Code. So just looking at the process overview on the next slide, please. There's so many more activities that make a um, reinspection program valuable in addition to just the inspection itself. You know, it gives a chance to do a comprehensive file review to see if there's any outstanding work orders. It gives us a chance to provide a questionnaire to the property owner, which is a mandatory part of the program. Find out if anything's changed since the time they put the septic in. Have they done renovations that we weren't aware of or maybe that the building department here at the municipality wasn't aware of? We can pick up on some of those types of things. But I would say most importantly, it's the education piece of this program. The education cannot go undervalued. Um, we're seeing more and more of of residents from typically urban centric areas that are relocating to this area um, and they flush the toilet and the sewage goes away right that's how it is in the city we uh, most of us here I think know that it's not quite the same when you're on an on-site sewage system so these programs give an excellent opportunity for the education piece when we are actually conducting the inspections um, and and I think feedback that we've heard from residents that's that's what they appreciate you know many of them will receive a copy of their diagram yeah it's chicken scratch from 1979 when the septic was installed Installed, but it's more information than they had previously. So it is a cyclical uh, process for us starting in quarter one. A huge shout out to Derek, one of your staff members who always helps us get the list of properties each and every year. So um, really good information comes forward there. And then we sort of decide what is going to be inspected. We will review that list, look for exemptions. So exemptions could be any properties that had a new septic installed within the last 10 years. And then the process just continues. There's communication out, we start scheduling the inspections and the crux of the inspections actually happen between uh, July and October, I would say. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This slide I've, uh, I've used for many years because it hasn't changed. Um, luckily, we're, we've been able to hold the fee for septic reinspection at $325. Um, that's the breakdown of the fee there. And uh, for the programs in Trent Lakes, there is no direct billing to the residents. The Peterborough Public Health Unit will bill the municipality and then reimbursement happens that way. So just wanted to share what the fee was and that's still where we're sitting. So we can jump ahead um, two slides now because I just have a nice slide that says, let's, let's talk about the numbers. It's a numbers game and it is always a game it seems trying to track down a lot of the data. So I'll first uh, touch base on the mandatory maintenance inspections, which I mentioned were specifically in Alpine Village and Buckhorn Lake Estates. Uh, so 2021, we had 64 properties that were subject to this program that was up one from 2020. And uh, again, these inspections are, are required every five years. Uh, we had 41 inspections that were planned or scheduled or due in 2021, but unfortunately only 22 inspections were conducted. And this is, this is for a variety of reasons. I would say the, the most common reason from residents was they weren't coming up to the property because of COVID restrictions or they didn't want anyone at their house because of COVID restrictions. So we, uh, we have had a setback because of COVID like most programs. And while we're starting to leave COVID in the rear view mirror a little bit, we're still kind of feeling the effects of that setback. So just a note about that. Um, we were really in the peak of the pandemic in 2021 and it was a challenge for sure. We didn't push it with residents either. I mean, I think everybody had enough challenges at that time. So we were really cautious with how much we were pushing. Of the 22 systems inspected, only five systems required some minor maintenance work, which could be things like baffle replacements, pump outs, and then three required major maintenance work. So a repair or a replacement of the sewage system. Next slide, we'll talk about the 2022 recap. Um, and, and so we had much fewer deferred systems in, in that case, but what we found was the challenge at that point was non-response. People just stopped responding to us, which is tricky. Um, we've, we've never really encountered that before. 
part of what we found was change of ownership in these areas and not having a understanding or a history of, of the program and of the obligated requirements of the property owner. So we went up again another property last year. We're now at 65 properties requiring mandatory inspections. And uh, we had 22 that were planned. And like I said, we've made various attempts for contact, both you know, drop bys, phone calls, in writing, and there is a high level of non-response. Um, this is not unique to the municipality of Trent Lakes, I will say for this program, this is a, a trend that we are seeing across the areas that we serve. Um, so with the uh, six inspections that we did conduct last year, only one system required uh, minor maintenance work and one system required major maintenance work. So um, if we look ahead to 2023, if we go to the next slide, our current year, there's about 13 properties that are due as part of their five-year cycle for inspections, plus we will pick up some of those deferred properties. Those individuals who are non-responsive, they, they don't just get out of the program. It is a mandatory, provincially mandated program. We have started to issue orders. Um, we, we are fairly unique as a jurisdiction for this. I know other jurisdictions will not proceed with orders to comply for reinspection, but we have done that. Um, we've, I, I know for sure we've issued eight for non-response and we are actually starting to get responses to the orders. The orders get sent by mail as well as posted on site. So we are seeing better turnaround with that. So I'm hopeful that we will start to see some increased response. When we can, we do book inspections with homeowners. Again, I mentioned that education piece and it's really, really critical to the success of this program. Um, so we'll start reaching out to the property owners who are due for mandatory inspections in quarter three this year with instructions on how to prepare for their inspections and be able to facilitate and support them however we can. So that's up and coming. So next slide, we'll switch gears a little bit and I'll talk about the other reinspection program, the discretionary program. So we receive the list each year at the beginning of the year from the municipality. So in 2021, our list had about 275 properties. And then once we started screening that list for exemptions, we did request more because there were several exempt properties if the system was installed 10 years or newer. If it's within the last 10 years, we wouldn't do an inspection. In 2021, the geographical area focused on numerous fire routes uh, surrounding Kachakoma, Beaver, and Mississauga Lakes. And we did divide the property up into zones again. That was something new we had done in 2020 just to provide some better timeframes for residents so that they weren't leaving components of their septic system open and exposed all summer for us. Next slide, please. For 2021 results, this slide is a little bit information heavy, so I'll just take some time and, and walk through it. Um, it's a bit too digest, so feel free to think of any questions you may have as well. These results are combined for, for the year total and for all of the, all of the zones that we did. Um, you can see that in 2021, a repeated <laughs> pattern in the discretionary program as with our mandatory program, we had a high number of deferrals. And again, we were in the peak of COVID-19 measures. We were had, we had orders not to travel, not to come to properties and that type of thing. So it is, it is reasonable that that number is high. Um, if you look at the minor deficiencies of the inspected systems, about 18.8% had minor deficiencies, which could include baffle replacement, overgrown vegetation, a septic tank needing to be pumped out, those types of things. And um, it was wonderful that we only saw 1.2% in 2021 with major deficiencies. So that was, that was actually a good news story there. The major deficiencies could be, like I said, the septic system needing to be replaced, repaired, a steel tank in the ground, that type of thing. Um, just, to, just a note about the numbers that properties could appear in more than one category. They could have both a minor and a major deficiency. And so the percentages there don't add up to 100. We're actually a little less than 100 and the remaining properties would have been captured in most likely the exempt properties. Sometimes we don't know they're exempt until we go and then we see that they're vacant because if we haven't heard back from the owner, we will attend the property anyways. And if it's vacant, we put it on our exempt list at that time so it could be captured there. Um, certificates for 2021 have uh, been sent out and we are seeing good compliance with minor and major deficiencies for those systems now. 
just some comments. Um, if we go to the next slide from the inspector that conducted the 2021 season, uh, the slowdowns and challenges that I've mentioned as part of the COVID-19 public health measures resulted in an abundance of deferral requests. So those are properties that we are going to have to pick up and consider in future years for a successful program. Um, the inspector did note a significant amount of property ownership turnover. Again, that bleed from urban centric to rural areas that we mentioned before. And that is creating some logistical challenges if you've sent the letter out, but maybe it went to the old owner and, you know, in the two or three months of communication, the property has changed hands. It is a little bit of chasing down when that happens. So it can, it can be a challenge. But overall, we continue to receive largely positive feedback from residents, which is great. Um, there's general support for the program and education is one of the greatest benefits still. And um, like I mentioned, the, we are seeing some progress in resolving the deficiencies that have been identified. Next slide, please. So similar to 2021, in 2022, our geographic area um, was, was still the same. The focus was uh, still around Mississauga Lake Road, Beaver Lake Road, County Road 507, and several fire routes in the vicinity. Um, we had the list of 291 properties, which were supplemented with the 2021 deferrals. So I was trying to think back. I don't think we requested more properties in 2022 because we had enough to go off of with the deferrals. So next slide, please. And we'll just quickly talk about the 2022 results. The slide will look similar to 2021. Um, but here, the second line, the property deferral request, you can see that's dropped to four, whereas in 2021, it was 60 something. So um, we didn't have the COVID measures in place. So there wasn't the request for deferrals. They were more extenuating circumstances, um, significant health impacts to the residents and that type of thing that caused the deferrals. So um, again, the, the percentages are, are good. We have only 3.3% with minor deficiencies, only 0.8% with major deficiencies. So um, a number that we added in this chart, though, was properties unprepared for inspection. So this, this was properties that um, didn't uncover their septic tank lids, for example, or, or maybe didn't get us the information back that we had needed. So those all cause challenges to the progress of the reinspection program. But uh, overall, it was another um, really successful year. We have had a bit of a slowdown in issuing some certificates for the properties that were inspected last year. So that work is ongoing. So if you hear from anybody that they haven't got their certificate, it's coming. <laughs> we just need a little bit more time for that one. So. Um, thinking about the inspector's comments, if we go to the next slide for 2022, um, it is that continuation of the property ownership turnover and general contractors and uh, sewage system installers are in high demand right now, which is, which is great. One thing that we are seeing since we've spent two years up in that area is we are seeing some proactive replacements of sewage systems, which is really great as well. So even though somebody doesn't have to do it, they're choosing to do it because they know it's probably inevitable anyways. Um, this, this isn't necessarily a new challenge, it's an ongoing challenge, but Airbnbs are, as I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, when it comes to sewage systems, Airbnbs have a huge impact on sewage systems. So it is one thing to uh, receive an owner questionnaire delineating the number of bedrooms and plumbing fixtures and whatnot. But if you've got a four bedroom house reasonably under the code that can, can that can accommodate eight people, um, but we all know there's advertisements out there where 14 people are there because there's futons in different areas. So when we do come across those and often we'll, as we're talking with a neighbor, they'll sort of start talking about some other people. We do take the opportunity to provide education to property owners who openly disclose that it's an Airbnb situation and especially about the risks the, the actual physical damage to the sewage system they're doing and the long-term impacts, the nutrient loadings on the lake. And ultimately we do put it back on, it's their property value that they're potentially impacting. So it is a little bit of a new tangent with the program that we are paying attention to now. Next slide, please. I'm almost done, I promise. I haven't really paid attention to my time. Very um, the 2023 reinspection program plan. Um, first off, a huge shout out to Councillor Armstrong and to Derek again, who have been essential in the logistics for the program. 
this program is uh, unlike any other year because we are doing water access only inspections, um, which which causes a whole other host of, of challenges and safety concerns and risks and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we're focused on properties on Pencil Lake, Catacoma, Bottle, Gold, Beaver Lake, and Mississauga Lake. So we will attempt to complete more of those deferred properties as well to supplement to try to get close to the 300 properties. Um, <coughs> We really are overcoming, and, and I think this program will be a huge success. It's a it's a trial. It's definitely a new approach, but uh, due to the tenacity, I think of our public health inspector Bozow, who's conducting the program, um, we're we're uh, we're getting through it. So I'll have an update for that uh, next year when that program concludes. But I'm just I'm very fortunate that Bo hasn't been carried off by the mosquitoes yet. I think it was close one day. But next slide, please. <clears throat> So um, talking about the future of maintenance inspection programs, and we have to talk about the future of the sewage program as a whole. So the current contract for the provision of services related to on-site sewage systems between Peterborough Public Health and the local municipalities expires in November 2024. It has been communicated to the municipality that when that contract expires, Peterborough Public Health will no longer be delivering the services related to on-site sewage systems. So that's a really big factor to keep in mind when we think about what the future of the reinspection program will be, specifically in 2024, and if we will operate a fulsome reinspection program, if we will use it as a catch-up and a tidy-up year. I think there's there's a Lot of different ways that we can go about it but what I am suggesting today is that um, Peterborough Public Health myself and staff work with municipal building department staff and starting quarter four of this year to really hash out what the reinspection program could look like and I think that could be done in conjunction and alongside our conversations about the sewage program transition which are going to be starting in the next few weeks so and that's all I have. My next slide is just to say thank you so much for having me today, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Well, thank you very much, Julie, for your presentation. Very informative once again. Uh, any council members have a question? Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Armstrong. I think it's more a comment, a couple of comments, if I may. Sure, um, first of all, I, through you, I'd, I'd like to thank Julie and her, her staff for, for persevering. This is the eighth year of the program by my count <laughs> and uh, we'll get the full program to date statistics from PPH but my informal count shows that we've had about a 10 percent failure rate over those eight years which says to me this is a program that's necessary and it's working and it's important um, I think most of us know that we are a municipality of lakes over 50 lakes and water bodies and there are two really critical things to maintaining the water quality one is natural shorelines and the second is properly functioning septic systems. So this is a very critical program. Um, the only other comment I wanted to make was that, you know, thanks for, for looking at the water access only properties. They are the most, could be the most challenging and the most problematic because uh, it's very, very expensive to get a barge out to your property and to do the pump out, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a suspicion that more of our problem we may see more problems in those locations than others so uh, great that we're finally getting to it despite some of the hurdles and logistics yes. challenges um, so that was all I needed to say um, but very very important program I know that we'll be working to find a replacement provider uh, into the future whether it's our municipality or whether we work with other municipalities who have also benefited from PPH's services and uh, doing something consolidating with them but we will certainly be looking for a replacement because um, it's too crucial to ignore. Okay, thank you, Karen. Any other questions, comments? I'm seeing none. Well, thank you very much, Julie, for the presentation. I would entertain a motion to receive that. Move. Councillor Cadigan to move. And the seconder is Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor. Thank you. That motion is carried. Thank, thank you very, very much, much, Julie. Very informative. Yeah. Okay, we can move on to item 8.2 of our agenda, which is Jerry McIntosh, Assistant Vice President of Public Sector of Aon. Is Jerry in the building? Jeffrey, oh, he's on. Oh, Jeffrey, sorry. There we go. <coughs> Good afternoon, Jeffrey. Good afternoon. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, 
Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Member, for having me today. Um, just wanted to give you a brief update on the municipal insurance market. Um, we just went through your insurance renewal at the end of uh, the previous month. And uh, we have some good news. So this year we actually got an 8% decrease. And I know I've been here a couple of times in the past and had to deliver um, increases. So um, we worked very hard on your account this year to get a decrease. Um, so good news. And we're hopefully to continue that down the line as well as the insurance market softens. So just a, a brief presentation here. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. So what we found with the insurance market this year is that the pricing environment has moderated, which is a good thing. Um, there are some lines of business that are still increasing, such as cyber, um, excess liability, and things like that. But uh, overall, we're seeing a softening of the insurance market. The last couple of years, as I mentioned, have been very hard on you know all consumers, but especially municipalities. Um, but we're, we're we're starting to see it soften a bit, and we're hopeful this will continue um, you know for the next few years. Um, Underwriters are still really looking at the risks on a one-off basis, so they need a lot of information. So we're working really hard with staff to make sure that we have, you know, updated property values, updated risk management policies and things like that. And, you know, ultimately what that comes down to is, is lowering the amount of claims that the municipality has. Because the, just like your home, home or auto insurance, the less, the less claims you have, the, the lower your premiums will be in the future. So we're working really hard to be proactive and working hard with staff to make sure that, um, you know, that's claims aren't occurring and luckily and due to the prudent work of your staff um, there has been a very good um, claims outcome over the past few years uh, so deductibles and retentions have been increasing uh, we haven't increased yours this year um, i think that was probably about two years ago when they were increased but um, insurers are still asking for um, clients to have more skin in the game and you know take more responsibility for those deductible levels um, but we think we found a good level with your municipality that that offers the best balance of pricing um, with a retention level that you're comfortable with. And lastly, unfortunately, cyber attacks are still increasing. Um, I'm sure you've seen it on the news and, and um, you know, on the papers and things, but um, they're becoming more sophisticated. And, and it's really, um, you know, cyber insurance policies are really a, a must have at this point, especially for municipalities. Um, I, I wouldn't say you're an easy target, but you know, um, not not your municipality in general. You've just upgraded your IT system, so it's, you're you're a very good risk. But you know, municipalities in general um, are targeted quite frequently, so it's it's imperative that we have you know not only a, a cyber insurance policy in place, but also make sure that we have the controls in place to ensure that it doesn't happen in the, in the first place. Next slide, please. So again, what we're doing to you know stabilize your pricing is risk management. So. Um, again, working to lower the frequency and severity of the claims, ensuring proper record keeping. Um, and again, your claims history is improving, which is great. And that's really due to the staff um, and, take, and making it a priority amongst, you know, not just one person, but amongst your entire staff that, um, you know, if, if there's something out of place or if there's hazards, they're identifying it and fixing them before they actually become claims. And, and that's really what insurance companies like to see. Um, so we're, they're doing a great job with that and hopefully that will continue to cause price decreases in the future as well. Um, as I mentioned before, your IT systems have been recently upgraded, so um, that's great for any cyber claims or cyber attacks. And we have um, we have given that information to your, your insurers and they have you know come down a little bit on pricing. So I believe the pricing for cyber was stable this year, if not a little bit under as well. Um, and that just goes to show that, that you're on the right track in terms of how you're updating your, your IT systems. What we do at Aon here is, is all of our clients, we try and tell a specific story to the underwriters and the insurance companies. Um, you know, as the market was hardening, um, we really had to emphasize the clients that were doing really well um, and really show insurance companies that, hey, this is a good risk to insure. Um, we need better pricing. And and what really happens with, with Aon as opposed to some of our competitors in the marketplace is that we don't have a set program of insurance. So, you know, uh, someone else may have a, a program that says you have to be with this liability insurer, this auto insurer, and it kind of comes as a whole package. What we do at Aon is that we scan the entire marketplace to find, you know, okay, this insurance company is willing to, to cover this with this coverage at this price, you know, and compare it to some other insurance companies and, and what, what they can offer. So we can kind of leverage that, um, you know, leverage those quotes against each other. Uh, and that's really where the savings came from this year. So um, we were actually able to offer two different liability quotes to, to, to your municipality. And that is really what drove the overall decrease of 8%. Um, because we were able to say, hey, 
coverage on this one is also good. You know, we we do the coverage comparisons internally as well. We wouldn't offer something that was that was less coverage than what you currently have. Um, but, but having those relationships, scanning the entire market has allowed us to look for um, different deals that are out there. Um, and you know, this is the insurance market is tough for municipalities. There's not that much competition in there. So the fact that we were able to offer some different options and different liability pricing from different carriers, um, I think really drove um, the pricing decrease this year. Next slide, please. One of the things we've been working on with staff this year is looking at possibly implementing a, a facility user program. Um, so basically what that is, is so that, um, you know, people or groups that use your facilities, whether it be uh, your ice pad or um, community centers or um, even the town hall council chambers, um, it, it's prudent to have those users provide insurance. That's obviously, that's, that can't be the case for everyone, obviously, but there are new technologies and new kind of insurance coverages now that allow people to, to, to buy insurance online for these types of, of events. Um, so, you know, if you're having, let's say, a, a wedding anniversary party at the community hall, you'd be able to go online, um, you know, purchase the insurance for, let's say, $30, depending on the time, you know, if there's alcohol, things like that, that would, you know, increase or decrease the risk. Um, and basically what that does is, is gives another layer of protection for the municipality so that if something did occur at that party, um, there would be another insurance policy in place. So it wouldn't fall directly onto your municipal insurance policy. It would go through the facility user um, insurance policy first, whether that be two million or five million in coverage before it would ever reach the actual municipal um, insurance program. Also things like, you know, ice hockey, um, outdoor sports. So there's, there's a, a varying amount of risk to all these things and the pricing takes into account this, but you know, there's other things such as, you know, uh, card games and, and, you know, business meetings and things that would be very, deemed very low risk. And that might just be, you know, a couple bucks per hour or a couple bucks per you know day or things like that. Um, but it's something we've been discussing with um, staff members um, and they've been trying to obviously balance out the need for it versus, you know, the cost to residents and, and, and people. So um, it's something that we'll work on into the, the new term as well. Um, but this is something that most other municipalities have in place in some form uh, because it does offer that extra level of protection so that you don't have those claims hitting your uh, municipal insurance program. Next slide, please. Yeah, so that's that's basically all I want to discuss today. Um, you know, we do have a lot of leverage. Aon is a very large international uh, company. Um, we do place a lot of premiums, so um, we look to leverage that with our um, you know different insurance partners and things like that. But um, really happy with the result this year, and we hope to keep on delivering you decreases you know into the future as well. Um, but again, it all depends on claims. Um, but, you know, the staff have been doing a very good job at the municipality to drive risk management kind of holistically throughout the organization. And that's really what's driving the, uh, the pricing down in, in general. Next slide, please. And I just want to say thank you for having me today to, to speak with you. Uh, thank you for your business. And I would uh, be happy to answer any questions that uh, you may have. Okay, thank you very much, Jeffrey. Anyone on council have any questions of okay. Jeffrey? Seeing Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, for you, uh, Mayor Lamstead. Uh, two questions. One, I don't need an answer right now, but I don't know that I have seen uh, a history of the number of claims that we have placed with you. It would be kind of interesting to know how many claims we are placing per year and for what amount. So I would love to see that. Um, the second thing, you kind of raised a red flag with me when you were talking about the hall rental and event policy and discussions about requiring the users to pay for insurance for their event. Um, mm -hmm. We're trying to expand the use of our uh, three community halls, which are currently, in my view, underutilized. And, you know, I'm not sure that it's the right approach to have every group paying for their own insurance. Um, the people that go to play euchre one afternoon and the people that go to you know, do something else or have a yoga class or whatever. I'm, I recognize that it shifts the risk, but it also is a, uh, an obstacle in trying to expand the use and have a welcoming open environment for our community members. So I don't think we're making decisions today, but if we are looking to review that, I think we need a more personal <laughs> conversation about the pros and the cons uh, of all of that. 
thank you for that for that question. And for the first part of that, I'll say I'd be happy to provide staff with a, their most recent loss fund that has the claims on it. Um, so um, if you'd like to request that from staff, I will be able to provide that for them. Um, and the second part, the facility user, I understand where you're coming from 100%. It, it does really, what, it, what does matter is the level of risk that the municipality is willing to take on themselves. Um, you know, this is not something that, that's a must have. This is something that, that we offer that we think, you know, adds that, you know, we're, we're trying to protect your assets, protect the people. So it's something that, that is that extra layer of, of, of protection for the municipality. But again, you know, it, it does shift the cost burden to the actual user. Um, so that's something that has to be uh, recognized before this would be ever be implemented in the first place. But happy to discuss further. Um, if you want to, if, if you would like me to have another presentation, either with council or with staff that just talks about this one topic, I'd be happy to do that as well. I think I think council would like to be involved in anything that uh, uh, is discussed about that topic. Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you, through you, Mayor. Uh, thanks very much, Jeffrey, for your presentation. My, uh, uh, it's more of a comment slash question, but it dovetails uh, Deputy Armstrong's comments. Uh, I have had uh, many, many uh, conversations with uh, constituents mm -hmm. who do utilize the uh, Buckhorn Community Center um, uh, ice pad, uh, as well as um, during the summertime. There's uh, many. Uh, pickleball uh, players and whatnot. So the hockey and pickleball, it involves multiple players. Um, so I guess uh, the question is, if you have 10 skaters on the ice or uh, four pickleball players, do each individual have to, uh, you know, obtain their insurance? Uh, I mean, as Deputy Mayor Armstrong said, we're trying to we're trying to welcome more activity in our uh, community centers as well as our uh, ice pad and whatnot. Or any other activity, uh, so uh, we we're just hoping it doesn't become uh, prohibitive, um, any costs and whatnot, uh, as well as um, we just don't want uh, the municipality to be seen by any insurance companies as uh, if they're assuming the risk um, of uh, covering the ice pad, pickle, pickleball, or, or whatever else uh, that the uh, municipality gets penalized as far as. Um, uh, premiums and whatnot. Yes, so thank you for that that comment. So um, that is something that, that the insurance companies would look at, obviously, but um, I think this is in discussions with staff already. That is one of the issues that you, that you did bring up is that, you know, it's it could be just a drop in hockey session where it's just, you know, random people are dropping in as opposed to a team setting and, and things like that. So. A lot of the basically what we're promoting with our clients is an online tool. So it's basically saying, you know, you go to this website, it has all the information about all your locations, the different type of activities, and they would pay for it, you know, via credit card or PayPal or however they want to online. Um, but that was something that's definitely something we'd have to look at because, you know, I wouldn't expect every single um, person that's going to go on the ice to. to buy their own insurance individually. Um, usually it's more done on a team dynamic or, you know, a league or, you know, let's say it's Thursday night, you know, senior hockey, maybe they would buy it, you know, as a, as a group, as opposed to, you know, the individual person. But those are all issues that would have to be ironed out uh, long before we'd ever implement something like that uh, in the municipality here. Follow up, go ahead. Thank you, Jeffrey. Just uh, through you, Mayor, uh, just further to that with you. You just uh, I understand what you're saying there. I just my concern is mission creep. Uh, uh, whereas you know you start off with uh, you know offering it online to sp certain specific users like teams and whatnot, and then that just creeps into well it's it's been working so well online that that uh, you know we're going to uh, morph into you know each individual uh, requiring insurance. And, we're trying to make it easier for our residents uh, as opposed to uh, making it more cumbersome to uh, to obtain insurance and we want to we want to entice and attract as opposed to detract thank you okay any other questions go ahead councillor Cadigan. jeffrey thank you for your presentation this might seem like it's from left field but it's kind of uh topical for our township mm -hmm. insure docks privately held docks or municipal docks for that matter i 
personally have never insured any dogs, but I think it's something that, that I'm sure there's an insurance product out there for that type of thing. <laughs> dogs. Dogs with a C K. Do dogs. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Was... Docs. Yes. Yeah, so I know there has been um, some conversations about that with staff as well on some of the docs that are on publicly uh, or municipal owned land. Um, so we have been working through that process as well because um, I know that some of the some of the ratepayers are not able to get insurance or it's very cost prohibitive as well. So that is something we've been working on um, with with staff. Um, I, I I don't know if we had a resolution to that yet, but the issue with that is that you know. It is on municipal land and you are not in control of the actual docks or the operations of the docks. So if something were to occur, they would definitely include the municipality as a um, claimant in that in a lawsuit. And so that's kind of, you know, again, it, it all boils down to the risk tolerance of the municipality. If you're willing to take on that risk and say, you know, that's okay, we're allowing people to use our do use their docks on our land. Um, but, you know, you'd, you'd want to really look at the risk management around that, whether it's, you know, inspections, signage, waivers, things like that, that'll help protect you. Um, but I know that that is a very tricky subject as to, you know, who's actually control, who who has ownership, who should be providing insurance. And, and so it, it's something we have been discussing with staff um, and we'll look to, to ensure that we have a clear, concise um, options for the municipality when it comes to, to docs. Thank you. Not docs. <laughs> I'm sure we can insure our dog. <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? I am seeing none. I would like to thank you, Jeffrey, for your for your presentation. That was excellent. And we look forward to some more reductions in our insurance premiums. <laughs> thank you very much. I will entertain a motion to receive that. Motion. Go ahead, Councillor Braver. A motion to receive. And a seconder. Councillor Franzen for a seconder. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay, we can move on to item nine of our agenda, which is delegations. Jim Adamson, would you like to speak to item 9.1? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, councillors. Uh, my name is Jim Adamson, as you know, and I'm the National Vice President of the Canada's 911 Ride Foundation. Um, back in 2001, I was a tactical officer with the Toronto Police Service when the attacks happened in New York City, Pennsylvania, and in Washington, D.C. And at that time, I was trained in that field, and we offered our services to go down and assist during that horrific event. Fortunately, I can say, they were overwhelmed with support and we weren't able to go down because they didn't have enough accommodations for us. So we had to decide what we wanted to do. We started selling t-shirts. We sold $170,000 worth of t-shirts in 60 days. I'm not a big fan of t-shirts anymore. <laughs> um, subsequently, we went down and we presented that money to help the widows and orphans. And at that time, it struck me, we should be doing something up here to assist our families of first responders and also children that are impacted as a result of the criminal act. And then along came the Mikey network, providing public access to fibrillators free of charge to communities so they can save lives. So where I'm going with this is we started in 2006 and that first year we had a little girl, Katie Manchester, she was eight years old. Katie was at home with a babysitter when her mom and dad went out to celebrate their 17th wedding anniversary. They were driving home and they were struck and killed by two cars racing up the street. We had Katie at our first dinner and God love her, she had a pretty little dress on and she asked if she could get up and speak at the lectern. So we brought a chair up so she could get up and speak onto the microphone. And she was just as cute as a button and wonderful. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And at that point in time, I knew we had to continue to do this to help people. So our mandate is to help families of police, fire, EMS, and also the children and to provide the defibrillators free of charge. To date, we have 49 confirmed saves with our defibrillators. We hope people never have to use it but it's nice to know if it's there, it can save a life. 
we turned around after the shooting down on the Danforth and there was a little girl, Juliana Kosas. She was at a restaurant having ice cream with her mom and her dad and her brother. The gunman just came down the street and randomly opened fire. We created a bursary for the family. We turn around and assist whatever way we can. And so many first responders have embraced this. We have the fire departments through the different jurisdictions that we go through. They stand at the side of the road, they'll drape Canadian flags over their equipment. We have the paramedics that are out there. And the reason I say this, on August 25th, we're coming through Trent Lakes. We'll be starting down in Selwyn Township around 10 a.m. So we should be into Trent Lakes, I would think by about 25 minutes maybe. And then we're gonna continue on our way up to Halliburton, ultimately ending up at the Nottawasaga Resort. That'll be the end of our first day ride. Our second day, we're going up and through the Muskokas and back down and then we have a big gala dinner. And all the people that are recipients or their families uh, will be at that function and we will provide bursaries and assistance to these families. And we will also dedicate public access defibrillators to communities of the family's choice. And on the plaque that goes with it, it will state so they may continue to serve their community. That's another thing that we do. This year is gonna be a real heartbreaker for us. Andrew Hong of the Toronto Police Service, who's been one of our escorting officers, for I would say the past six or seven years, was out in uh, Halton area and training Peel Regional Police Officers. He went in to grab his lunch at a Tim Hortons. A gunman walked into the Tim Hortons and executed him. This year, we're calling it Ponger's Rolling Thunder, the Friday event, and that's the event that's coming through this area. We will have approximately 200 motorcycles coming through, being ridden by nice people, let me assure you. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have 50 uniformed escorting officers, all on police bikes, all in uniform. This crowd is kept very orderly. We have paramedics that are also riding in the group and we have support vehicles. And when we stop at communities, the communities we stop in, we make donations. Our first stop this year will be in Romero and they have requested a portable Honda generator. We're donating that. On the Saturday, we'll be stopping in Gravenhurst. They've requested a defibrillator for the Gravenhurst Fire Service. We're donating that. And we constantly give back. Since our inception in 2006, we've raised, raised approximately $1 million. And it's all gone back out to communities. So I came to let you know we're going to be in your area on August 25th. We would love to see your support. We'll be starting down in Selwyn Township. I've already been informed that the mayor and the council are going to be there at 9.30 a.m. and we'll be leaving at 10 a.m. And you're welcome to attend. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very moving. Any comments or questions from council? Great, Councilor Brady. Uh, through you, Mayor. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jim, for uh, presenting. I know we've we've been having conversations and whatnot, and and what uh, Trent could do, and and where you were coming through uh, on Trent. So you're coming up 36. Yes, we'll be coming up 36 north. and up the 507, continuing up into Halliburton. <clears throat> I understand uh, the Cavendish Fire Station. Uh, the firefighters are going to be out. They've told me they're going to be there, and they're also going to be in Buckhorn. There, okay. Which is wonderful. Excellent. Any other comment? Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. I just to follow up through you, Mayor Lamb said, "What can we do to support you?" <laughs> come it's a out, very moving presentation. Yeah, come out uh, <laughs> and participate. If you're hungry, there's pancakes being served in Selwyn. <laughs> and uh you'll get to meet the people that are there I, i've got people that come out every year and uh we don't make this a big event i don't want to have like 600 motorcycles going through a community then you're intrusive we don't need that we want to just be able to come in and go through and and not cause trouble but the people that are riding in the event they've turned around and said can we raise money and donate it on our own I said, well, you feel so inclined I've got a gentleman this year named Dave Lefebvre who is donating $33,000 that he's gone out in his own and raised. That's, that's incredible. 
but these people want to give back. And as a result, they want to turn around and help other communities. And I think it's, it's wonderful. Go ahead, Councilor Mayor. Through you, Mayor. Uh, now I know you don't solicit for donations and whatnot. Would you be uh, would you be accepting of any donations if if council were to? Absolutely, donate? it goes back into the communities. Certainly. Councilor Mayor, we is a council interested in? Like, you can yes, see that hand going up. Through you, Mayor. Through you, Mayor. If I uh, can make a motion to um, subject to our CAO's input as far as line item. And, Availability of funds. Uh, if we could uh, donate five hundred dollars to uh, the Canada 911 ride, uh, we're seeing that it is uh, going to be involving our municipality, and and maybe sometime in the future you may land here, and we may be the recipients of some sort of defibrillator Absolutely. And, and that sort of thing. So, seeing as I live here, I'll make sure it happens. That, that's, <laughs> right. that's right. So, if I can make a motion, I have a motion and a seconder. Councilor Franzen for a seconder. I think we have to ask our treasurer and CAO if we have some discretionary funds available. So thank you and through you. So council does have the miscellaneous grant balance that has not been spent to date this year. And there is $4,976 in that for spending. Okay. We have a motion for 500 and a seconder for 500. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? The motion is carried. Uh, I was just wondering one other thing, if we could get an itinerary of your uh, ride. As uh, far as the entire route or just with just, regards just to Trent Lakes? Just in Trent Lakes so we know the exact times or approximate times that you're going to arrive, let's say the 507 Fire Hall. Okay, um, we're gonna be leaving uh, Classy Chassis and Cycle at 10 a.m., then a crossover to the Buckhorn Road. Yep. and then straight up so i'm not sure what the timeline would be i'm going to say we'd probably be up at the fire hall within 20 minutes to 25 minutes so does that sound reasonable 10 30. i would say mm -hmm. okay. and the date of that again august 25th which is a friday okay and as i said if anybody wants to come down to selwyn for the start um you could make that presentation in selwyn if you wanted or you could Make the presentation now if you have a presentation check just show that in selwyn we uh to the best of my knowledge are going to have media coverage down there now you might feel uncomfortable showing up selwyn town council i don't know <laughs> one question how much did they put <laughs> yeah yeah okay. so you're ahead of them already well thank you very much council i think that's an important thing to be helping with uh, thank you very much for all the efforts you put into this thank you it's an amazing initiative any other comments or questions? Go ahead, Councilor Brady. Through, through you, Mayor, uh, is, there, is there any way that we could uh, perhaps put something on our uh, website uh, when you sign into it? Uh, it would be it would be fantastic to have some, if there's some people available on the side of the road or even on the bridge in Buckhorn uh, as as the ride rolls through and, and I would say uh, be on the bridge by, so if leaving at 10 a.m., be on the bridge by 10.05 or 10 a.m and then they can wait for the ride. And I, I can, or through Jim, through you, Mayor, can provide you with a little uh, keynote, keynotes. It's, so, if I can add to this, it's a rolling block that we um, use. So it's similar to a foreign dignitary visiting Canada mm -hmm. and you escort them. So we don't want to be an impedance in the local traffic. We just want to be able to have safe passage going through. So you'll see an advanced team going through first. And then after the advanced team clears, then you'll see the what we call the rabbit, uh, which will be the first vehicle. And then you'll see all the outride motorcycles coming up and taking traffic points, securing the area. Once it passes, pardon me, once it passes, then they'll fall in at the back and the back back up to the front again and we just keep rolling like that all the way through excellent thank you very much that's fantastic i'll see you in tell <laughs> thank you very much and thank you for your time thank you very much thank you. Are there any motion i guess we've already had we have another one we receive it again Okay, we can move on to item 10 of our agenda, which is staff reports. We have public works 10.1.1. 1. 1. 
Chelsea Carpenter, would you like to, the Supervisor of Waste and Public Works Coordinator, would you like to speak to this item? Thank you, Mayor Lambshead, and through you. So this report is in regards to amending Schedule F of the Fees and Charges Bylaw and provides recommendations as directed by Council. At the June 20th Council meeting, Council passed the following resolution that Council refer the report to staff to come back with recommendations regarding incremental fee increases and notice of fee increases. The proposed cost increase for mixed loads is more appropriate in comparison to the waste disposal fee of other materials such as shingles and drywall, concrete and bricks, and construction and demolition, which range from $50 per cubic yard to $90 per cubic yard. The, mix, the current mixed load disposal fee is $55 per cubic yard. Additionally, the proposed increase is in line with neighboring waste disposal sites. This price change does not affect residents bringing in regular household garbage. And furthermore, residents that sort their loads will continue to be charged the respective waste disposal fees for whatever material they have in coming to the site and will not be impacted by the price change. Residents that do not sort their loads will be charged the mixed load waste disposal fee. Staff are recommending option one as outlined in the report and are of the opinion that a shorter notice period is acceptable as a price increase is to bring into alignment the already established and approved waste disposal fees with that of the mixed loads. Staff also feel it is important to rectify this discrepancy as soon as possible in order to remove opportunities for confrontation and challenges from residents which arise when the waste disposal fees as they currently stand. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you very much, Chelsea. Any comments or questions from Council? I am seeing none. Oh, sorry, Councilor Franzen, go ahead. More comment. Uh, uh, the option two, it, it was only two, two months uh, lag time before the total price would go on. So I don't think that would be uh, wise or appropriate. Uh, I would have preferred to see a six month uh, gradual increase, but uh, if that's not if that's not feasible, I think that uh, we should just go with the fee increase and, and be done with it. Two months isn't. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Cadigan, go ahead. I've spoken with some of the waste disposal staff through you, Mayor, and uh, would also support immediate raise in the cost. Any, right. other, any other comments? Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. Yeah. Just a question, immediate raise is neither of these options, is it? Option two has a... I thought we deferred to now to raise it. We deferred it to this meeting. So We did. Okay. We did. Yeah. Yeah. So we could implement it. Okay. Uh, I guess I was going to support okay. option one, which is to announce that there is an increase yeah. and give a three-month notice period and implement it October 1st, but all at once, not to stagger it because that's a little bit confusing. So that, yep. that made some sense to me. And I also talked to some of the transfer uh, attendants and they're anxious for this to happen. So, you know, it's a balance between providing appropriate notice to our residents, yep. but also resolving a problem for our attendants. And I think the three months probably strikes the right balance. And, and I, I, I agree with Deputy Mayor Armstrong, it's difficult to have a mixed load it could be all concrete and someone pays whatever we charge now and it should be a lot more so you go ahead Councilor I'll, I'll second that motion. you'll set that was that a motion that, that now is a motion <laughs> that was a big you. motion but now Thanks i hear it's it prompting <laughs> we have Councilor Franzen for a seconder any other conversation i'm seeing none i will call for the vote all in favor that motion has carried and we can move on to item 10.1.2 of our agenda, which is Chelsea Carpenter, our Supervisor of Waste and Public Works Coordinator. Would you like to speak to this file, Chelsea? Thank you, and through you, Mayor Lambshead. This report provides Council with the 2022 Waste Management Report. For 2022, Trent Lakes had a 61% diversion rate, an increase of 5% from 2021. Contributors to the increase in the diversion rate include the large increase in our organics material, which includes backyard composting, leaf and yard waste, as well as organics. This also included the significant food waste diverted through the food cycler programs. Additionally, the amount of material diverted through the reuse center also increased drastically. 
The reuse centers reopened in 2022 after being closed in 2021 due to COVID-19. Staff have seen a significant uptake in users of the reuse centers. Staff look forward to further enhancing waste diversion programs and researching any additional opportunities. As a reminder, Trent Lakes did just launch a new lumber reuse program, which has already been very successful and will contribute to our efforts to be an environmental leader. I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Chelsea. Anyone have any questions? Seeing Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. Thank you, through you, Mayor Lindsay. Uh, one comment, two questions. Uh, the comment is on the diversion. So first of all, thank you very much to staff for continuing to look for innovative ways to divert our waste. And it's nice to see that we are still a leader in that regard across the county at 61%. Uh, the two questions, the first one is I've asked Chelsea to give us an update on the organics processing facility uh, in Peterborough because we know that 40 to 60% of the waste is organics and that will be a big breakthrough item for us. And the second question, uh, I'll throw them all out now, is you mentioned that diversion rates will not be available after 2023 and I'm very concerned because I, I believe if you can't measure something, you can't manage it. And I'd like to find out if there's not a way for us to be able to get diversion rates after 2023. Okay, I will start with your first question. So through you, Mayor Lamb said, the update on the organics facility. So the County of Peterborough did provide a status update on this project last week. So the site's ECA, so the environmental compliance approval was amended and recently received approval from the ministry. The city of Peterborough is still waiting on an ECA for the air quality. Um, minor set or sorry, minor site preparation and construction is expected to begin soon. Um, the contractor who is completing the construction expects to meet the timeline for the city to roll out their new program that is planned for the end of October sometime. And I will say in preparation for a follow-up question, uh, Deputy Mayor Armstrong, I did ask the county what their plans were for expanding the current organics program. Um, that is currently in the county and the the response i received is that the county is interested in expanding organics in the county but what form that will take is uncertain at this time whether it's expanding into curbside collection more depot locations or food cyclers or other at-home options and that they plan to bring options for county council to consider within the next year thank you very much chelsea that was my question <laughs> So I'll stop there in case there's any questions with regards to that, and then I can move on to Councillor Armstrong or Deputy Mayor Armstrong's second question. Okay. I think you answered that. I think we're good. Go, go ahead if you would like to answer the second question. No problem. Through you, Mayor Lamb said. So the county, as my report outlines, the county currently prepares all of the data that they receive, um, and they form a diversion number for all of the townships. So with the County of Peterborough opting out of the recycling program and they're no longer being the data call that is required because um, the Blue Box program is moving to full producer responsibility, um, there's not going to be that opportunity. So um, at this stage, I'm uncertain what the county will be doing moving forward, if this is something that they're willing to assist the townships with, because like, as I mentioned, this is something that the county has always done in the past. So the townships aren't familiar with the back end process to create um, this number and how they go about doing that for consistency purposes. Uh, I mean that there's, we collect data as well, and that's a large component that we provide to the county, but how they come about forming um, the diversion number is a little bit unclear to me. So that's something that um, I know that for Trent Lakes that we'll be following up with the county on to understand that better, to see if there are opportunities to continue to do that, because I agree that it is important to continue to have that benchmark. Great, thanks Chelsea. I think, thank you for that explanation. I think what, uh, what uh, the mayor and I can do is raise that uh, at county council, because that's a really important metric that we need to keep uh, focus on and continue to uh, bring down. So. I will take that away to County Council. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I'm seeing none. Entertain a motion. Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Motion to receive. We have a seconder. Councilor Cadigan. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you very much, Chelsea.
Okay, we can move on to 10.1.3 of our agenda, which is Evan Grieger, our Director of Public Works. Would you like to speak to this item? Thank you, Mayor Lanzad. Do you, Mayor Lanzad, members of the Council, before you today is a report um, regarding a road occupancy and a road occupancy permit process. So um, interesting that we had the insurance come and speak about our risk management, because um, this sort of ties directly into it, because you're looking, this process is in, the intention is to have insurance for people that are doing work within our roadways. Um, this is a standard process that you typically see within the county if you do any work, even if uh, us as a municipality are doing work within a county road, we have to do a road occupancy permit through the county. And this is just, um, I assume that it is from their insurance company that to manage their risk as well. Um, so for us, it would be um, just a standard road occupancy permit process. You get information from the individual um, just to get an idea of what is actually going on in the road, how long you're going to be on the road. Um, but the big piece for me is getting that coverage of insurance. Um, this report isn't to approve the permit itself, but just to get direction from you to move ahead with the process. Um, I have been able to do a lot of the background work, so it would be something that I would be able to bring to the next council meeting, um, but we just wanted to confirm with council prior to moving forward with it that it would be something that council would be interested in looking. So, okay. any questions? Thank you very much. Any questions of council? Go ahead. Can you, Mayor Lamps, head, what examples would you be closing the road for this? So not necessarily the road closure, but could be so, for example, as Bell. So when Bell is doing their telecon work with them, you see them sometimes on the road shoulders or not a full closure, but they're just sort of off to the side when they're doing the boring stuff like that. Um, you have examples of, say, somebody wanted to do a parade or some sort, um, possibly movies, depending on your location. Um, just any work within the road allowance sort of thing, um, open road allowances, this is what it's focusing on. So um, here that doesn't happen too often, but it's more of when you get those questions from Hydro Bell, at least now you have something to say, yeah, this is our process, this is our permit that you need to complete prior to work being completed. Thank you. And those semi-partial blockages are more dangerous than a full blockage. It's, it's you, you have people trying to go around you and there's someone mm -hmm. coming the other direction. So important to have that coverage. Any other questions? I am seeing none. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? See, motion to Mr. Mr. There's, there's, there's a bit more to that motion than there, but I don't know if you wanted to see the recommendation. Or... If I can see it. I, I, I mean, if you... The council received the report from the Director of Public Works regarding the road occupancy and temporary road closure permits. And further, that council approved the use of the road occupancy permits and the temporary road closure permits for organization of individuals who wish to occupy the temporary close a municipal road. And further, that council direct the staff to create a road occupancy policy by bylaw and application to be brought up at an upcoming meeting for approval. Thank you, Councillor Friends. And do I have a seconder for that motion? The Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you very much, Evan Krieger. Okay, we can move on now to item 10.2 of our agenda, which is recreation and facilities. And 10.2.1 is Dylan Foster, Director of Recreation and Facilities. Would you like to speak to this item? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, before you, you have a report uh, for information and to request the transfer of funds from reserves to cover the cost of the repair at the Buckhorn Library as a result of a leak, um, which occurred in April of 2022. Um, due to a obstruction and a toilet that was left running overnight, we received a, a weekend call. Staff came in and got some uh, mitigation in place, and then we contacted one of our um, contractors to carry out the repairs. So the repairs have been completed. Um, I was in there this week. Looks quite uh, quite spiffy now, which is great. Um, but the, the cost of the repairs is over and above our allotted operating budget, um, which is $5,000. The cost of the repair is $9,335. That's due to most of the drywall in the OPP office having to be replaced, as well as um, approximately 100 
to 150 square feet of the new carpet tile that was installed um, earlier this year on the upper level of the library. Um, so those costs are, that, that's an all-inclusive cost there, um, plus our, our HST, obviously. Um, so yes, it was just uh, for information and to request the transfer from the library uh, maintenance reserve to cover that cost. Okay, thank you very much, Dylan. Any questions or comments from Council? And seeing none, just wondering if we found a cause for the leak. So it was um, reported that late in a day, a uh, member of the public came in, used the washroom. Um, nothing was reported um, to the staff, but there's sus suspected that a um, that the toilet was plugged and left running for whatever reason. It kept running. Both of the units in that um, in the library are brand new toilets this year. Staff are unable to replicate anything, trying it literally hundreds of times flushing the toilet um, to get it to, to repeat. Um, so the, the best answer we have is that there was an obstruction and for whatever reason, the water kept running and um, leaked overnight. It was reported to us through OPP, I believe. They uh, been on it. Thank you very much, Dylan. That's enough detail. <laughs> <laughs> I won't get into the material specifics. Well, thank you for that. Anyone prepared to make a motion? Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, receive the report and also to approve the transfer uh, of funds in the amount of 9000 and change. Do I have a seconder for that motion? See, Councillor Cadden. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Thank you very much, Bill and Todd. Thank you. We can move on to item 10.3 of our agenda, which is fire and rescue services. We have none. We can move on to 10.4 of our agenda, which is building and planning. And we can move to 10.4.1. And Sarah Della Marker, our junior planner, would you like to speak to this item? Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. On today's agenda, we have a report from planning staff regarding the property known municipally as 1177 Lakehurst Road. The property owner has submitted an application to eliminate the holding provision on their lands. The purpose of the property owner's request is to facilitate the construction of a single detached dwelling on a vacant lot. They have successfully filled the condition associated with the removal of the hold which required them to enter into a site plan agreement to ensure compliance with regulations outlined in zoning bylaw B2014-070. The imposition of the holding provision on the subject lands was initially stipulated as a condition of provisional consent to file number B-107-17. The primary objective behind the inclusion of the holding provision was to guarantee that any future development on the subject lands would strictly adhere to the provisions outlined in the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw. The applicant's proposal adheres to all relevant sections of the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw. Furthermore, the notice of intention to pass an amending bylaw to remove the holding symbol has been provided in accordance with Section 36 of the Planning Act. In response to the application, the municipality has received approximately uh, 12 correspondences from neighboring property owners see seeking clarification on the nature and implications of the holding provision for their properties. The municipality has clarified uh, to these property owners that as long as they possess legal deeded access over the fire route, which is owned by the landowner in question, their access rights will remain unaffected. Hence, the removal of the holding provision will have no impact on the fire route. Additionally, the municipality has received a claim from one of the property owners who utilizes the fire route, contending that their deeded access extends beyond accessing the fire route and grants them a legal right to traverse Ms. Shear's lot for water access. However, a thorough title search conducted by the applicant's solicitor has confirmed that this claim is entirely baseless. It should be noted that an unopened municipal road allowance borders the land between Ms. Shearer's property and Sandy Lake, which is considered public. 
Nonetheless, the municipality has not been presented with any legal evidence to support the abutting landowner's claim of entitlement to cross Ms. Shear's privately owned land for water access or anything beyond the fire route for that matter. Planning staff fully support the removal of the holding provision on 1177 Lakehurst Road and recommends that council receive the report. Furthermore, it is recommended that council approve the bylaw to eliminate the holding symbol of 1177 Lakehurst Road, which is an item for consideration on today's agenda so that Ms. Shear's construction may begin. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much there. Any questions or comments from council members? Councilor Braver, go ahead. Uh, through you, Mayor, I'll make a motion to receive the report and also council support the approval of a uh, bylaw to remove the holding symbol. Holding symbol, sorry. Thank you, Councilor Braver. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councilor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? <coughs> motion has carried. Okay, thank you very much. We can move on to 10.4.2 of our agenda. And Sarah Delamarker, our junior planner, would you like to speak to this item? Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. On today's agenda, there is a municipal appraisal form for consent file B-6-23, submitted by Paul Lula on behalf of the property owner 2380765, Ontario Incorporated. Um, unfortunately, upon receipt of the MAF, the applicants requested that the application be deferred to a future meeting date. Uh, in order for them to hold a meeting with staff to discuss the proposal in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess we can just, anyone prepared to make a motion to defer? I see Councillor Cranzen for a mover. Motion to defer, please. And Councillor Braybrook for a seconder. Any other conversation? I am seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We can move on to item 10.4.3 of our agenda, which is Sarah, Sarah Dilla Marker, our junior planner. Can you speak to this item, sir? Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. On today's agenda, there is a municipal appraisal form for consent file B-27-23, <coughs> submitted by the property owner, Laura greco -Gorty. Uh The subject land is located on a vacant lot at the corner of Sugarbush Crescent and Bancroft Road. The intent of the proposal is to create a new residential lot for residential purposes. Uh, please disregard the attached MEF, which suggests that the application will be supported. Um, there's a section in the Trent Lakes official plan that was interpreted in a way that has not been the county's practice. Uh, so specifically, section 6.2.1.1. It vaguely describes quote unquote land holdings that and how many of these holdings can occur every 15 years. It was originally interpreted that once the severance take place, the lands are considered in a land holding that cannot be severed again for 15 years. Um, even if the applicant didn't maximize the number of proposed new lots. Uh, it was clarified that the interpretation from the county was that up to two severances may occur in a land holding or a 15 year period. Um, it was also announced that the county's more specific interpretation will be implemented in the county's new official plan, which is yet to be approved by the province. But in the future, there will no longer be these discrepancies. Uh, it is worth noting that the proposal does align with the Trent Lakes Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw and the studies conducted fulfill the legislative requirements outlined in the provincial policy statement and growth plan for the Green Golden Horseshoe. Having conducted a thorough review of the application, staff strongly recommend the council supports the proposed severance application with the following changes to the MEF. Uh, one, that the application conforms to the official plan and that council recommends the application. Two, that the condition for an official plan amendment be removed. Three, revised comments that reflect the revised comments from staff in today's meeting. And four, that the application does conform to the official plan policies 5.2 and 6.2, and that all proposed uses are permitted. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Any other comments or questions from council? Go ahead, Councillor Cadigan. Through you, Mayor Lamb's head. For clarification, Sarah, does this mean that you're no longer required to hold to get a second severance? Because I thought that was a given, that's what I heard, so I'm just clarifying. 
Yeah, through you, through you Mr. Mayor. Um, so the interpretation I made from 6.2.1.1 was that um, it's worded in such a way that a land holding is considered a lot that has been a separate lot of record in the land registry office for 15 years. So the way I interpret that was as soon as you do a severance, those are separate and have to be recorded as separate for 15 years before you can do another severance, um, regardless of how many severances you can have to maximize. The county clarified that their interpretation was within this 15 year period, they are allowed to maximize. So though that maybe in 2012, for example, someone severed a lot, they can go in seven years later and split another lot as long as there weren't any prior in the last 15 years. That's a, that's a interesting, change, interesting in change in our yeah. ideas because I know several people that are waiting the 15 years that so, they probably don't have to because they only severed one lot off a large piece of property now they should be able to do that again interesting mm -hmm. well thank you very much for the clarification thanks for the question officer gavin any other comments or questions go ahead well, deputy mayor follow what Marilyn said i mean you're right there's a commonly understood mm -hmm. belief That's that right. mm -hmm. you know you can only do a severance procedure once every 15 years regardless of how many severances you make if that's no longer the case, then I think we need a way to communicate that um, just for general understanding because it's an important piece of information. I don't know how to do that, <laughs> but given that it's a surprise and new information to us, I'm sure it's new information to many of our residents, and I'm just suggesting we need a way to communicate that. That's a good idea. That's Deputy Mayor Armstrong. What is our way? <laughs> <laughs> That's for staff. I was okay. going to delegate that to staff. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. You can answer that. I threw you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so severance applications are generally a county process. And because the county is updating their official plan to reflect this new interpretation, um, I, I would say it's, it's really the county's responsibility to um, disclose what, what the plans are for the severances now and in the future. Um, now, I mean, there's there's a little bit of uh, unknown as to whether people are going to be applying for the severances now versus when the new policies are implemented for right. the provincial policy statement that might make it easier to sever in a natural heritage area. Um, so there are some uh, unknowns, but I would almost encourage um, the re any residents who have any questions about severances to first approach the county of Peterborough and then uh, if you know, if they have any other questions about the Trent Lakes interpretation um, to come and speak to me and we can set up a pre-consultation and discuss the policies in greater detail. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead, Councillor Braver. Through you, Mayor. Um, thanks, Sarah. Just uh, on, on the heels of the comment, as far as it's a, it's a county, um, I guess, responsibility, as our mayor and deputy mayor sitting on county council, uh, is there any sort of, uh, clarification that we can get through our mayor, deputy mayor, when, when they do sit on county council. If we did want to send some messaging out to our residents, uh, alerting them, uh, you know, is there, a, is there a process where we, we can get, or do we need approval from the county to put something out on our website, you know, a flash? Uh, can it be in coordination with the county, the county's, I guess, protocols and, and the municipality? And whether we can roll that out and then at least it directs our constituents to contact you or, or whomever yeah um but through you mr Mayor. um that's uh definitely a lot of work and uh coordination between the county and um the municipality i think what would need to be done is what specifically you're you're looking for to be advertised uh would need to be disclosed to the county um and because there are several um in going over some past preliminary severance reviews versus my own review of the the severance proposals uh, discrepancies in in numerous areas uh, between the county's interpretation and our interpretation um, so it's not limited to just one section of the bylaw. There, there are a few um, 
So it, 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 we could definitely correspond with the county and, and see what they would like to, to do. And I, I think that's important that we do have some communication with the county because the you know the new provincial planning statements coming out. There's a whole bunch of changes there. There's 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 a lot of changes coming in the near future for planning. So did you have did you have I was just going to oh. build on that. I um, through you, Mayor Lamb said perhaps it's a timing issue in part. You know maybe we should wait till provincial policy official policy get it right the official plan has been approved and now is now up for comment for 90 days so hopefully it will be imminent that that gets approved so there might be a timing thing but i'd almost suggest that planning staff come back to council with a report on what those differences in interpretation are i think that's important for us to understand and uh, what it is that should be communicated let's be fair the county doesn't communicate to our residents <laughs> so it's really going to be up to us to do the communication we definitely need to coordinate with them and, and get their buy-in if they're in charge of severances but the communication responsibility is ours um, so perhaps the way to handle it is to ask for a report you know in two or three months time of what those different discrepancies are in interpretation what the status of the new official plan is and what the proposal is for communicating any of those uh, updates new news changes in interpretation are would yeah. that be a fair resolution yeah, and i think that there's many changes yet to come that are coming down shortly so i think the, the delay and i think we need time to let the policy settle and then we can know what we need to advertise go ahead councillor braver sure you mayor uh, to, to add to uh, deputy mayor Armstrong's comments um the discrepancies uh, also, when you're looking at the discrepancies, like if if the county takes what takes precedence over what, just because there's a discrepancy, does that mean we can't proceed with something, that that sort of thing, or, or is it if it's a discrepancy, you know, can we not, are we allowed to just carry on? Yeah, um, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there have been some discrepancies that. Um, you know, we, we have to approach the external planning consultant for um, because some of some of them uh, go beyond my experience certainly um, so when I'm, I'm taking a look at something as uh, let's say a uh, an environmental impact study was submitted and it was in favor but a peer review was opposed to it and there's no further documents to review beyond that um, when I take a look at that, I'm not exactly sure what to do with those documents, right? Because I have two professionals with two very different conclusions. Um, so it's just things like that that, that get submitted and that I have questions about and, and need, need an, an external planning consultant's advice. I, I think we're putting Sarah on the gun a little bit too much yeah. here. That's yeah. not yeah. quite yeah. fair. Yeah. Let's, let's speak fair. to the item on the agenda. And yeah. I think we have a, do we have a motion even yet? Do we have did someone make a motion to I'm not even sure where we are. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Adele. Mr. Mayor, uh, we would be happy to prepare a report just to tell you what our policy says in the uh, official plan because our official plan for the municipality of Trent Lakes is the document. The county has their own document, however, ours is what we go by. And so we'd be happy to share that with you. We're not allowing more people to get additional severances. Everyone's allowed two within a 15 year period. But in terms of the interpretation of our policy, uh, if someone went for one severance, are they, do they have to wait the 15 years for the next severance? And so we've got some interpretation from the county that says, no, you're allowed two but in that 15 year period. So we'd be happy to provide something to council just for your own information and clarification. Yeah, thank I you. think that's a great idea. Thank you very much, yeah. Adele, for the simplifying our solution. Okay, is anyone prepared to make a motion about file number 10.4.3? There's been some significant, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Well, I think I'll, I'll make the recommendation now that we've heard all the, the this explanation, I think the, a recommendation from staff was us for to was for council to go ahead and approve this severance. Uh, so I will make that motion. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? 
Councillor Franzen for a seconder. Any other conversation about that motion? I'm seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Yes, Jesse Clark or Kirk, go ahead. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Lambside, I just wondered if we could formalize potentially that direction to staff uh, to report back on discrepancies in interpretation. Um, Deputy Mayor Armstrong had also mentioned the status of the official plan and recommendations regarding communication, but I don't know where we landed on what the motion will be. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Yeah, I, I like the motion. The only thing is I think the only discrepancies or differences in interpretation I would really be interested in are those that directly impact our residents. If it's something internal, administrative, process, you know, that's for you to sort out. But if there's anything like this one, and maybe there's, maybe it's isolated and we're jumping to conclusions. Um, but if there's anything like this specific one where severance is, we thought you already explained it. But if I think then that's the kind of discrepancy we would like to have brought forward in a report and not all the other internal administrative process discrepancies. Just, does that make some sense? Or did I confuse it more? <laughs> Are you okay with that explanation? Well, discrepancies that have a direct impact on our residents. I'm getting more confused. Right. Okay. And then were you also including the status of the official plan and recommendations regarding communication or were we just reporting back on the discrepancy? Let's just start with that. <laughs> we can go from there. Is that a new motion? Okay, that's I think a motion. Just lops off I need too. a seconder for that motion. <laughs> as confused as I am. Okay. Councillor Franzen for a seconder. Any other conversation? I am seeing none. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay. Now, we can move on to 10.4.4 of our agenda. Sarah Delamarker, our junior planner, would you like to speak to the bus? Thank you, for you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. On today's agenda, there is a request for municipal comments regarding the purchase of Crown lands on the parcels municipally known as 72 Fire Route 26, 68 Fire Route 216, and 54 Fire Route 216. I believe that we're supposed to say 216 for the 72 fire route. Just as a note, that might have been my mistake. Um, upon researching all three lots, planning staff were satisfied that all of the existing structures appeared to conform to the comprehensive zoning bylaw B2014-070 as amended. Staff are recommending that council supports the request to purchase the crown land. As all three property owners currently have put in an application to purchase the shore road allowance, planning staff are not recommending any additional conditions be applied at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's nice to see that people are purchasing their shoreline road allowance and try to buy some crown land as well. Okay, any comments or questions from council? I'm seeing I, Councilor Braver, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion to receive the report and also that council support all three uh, items, uh, requests as presented by Ms. Delamarter. Okay, do we have a seconder for that motion? Okay, Councilor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? Okay, none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we can move on to 10.4.5 of our agenda which is Adele Arbor, our planner. If you'd like to speak to this file, Adele. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. This report is regarding the administrative monetary penalty system, bylaw, and implementation of the program. I do have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, all right. So we've, in the last short little while, over the last couple of months, we've been working on this uh, penalty system and we've brought forward a number of uh, bylaws for implementation and I believe we shared in June to council and members of the public our very first rough draft of the bylaws. And as we progressed, we were able to improve those bylaws and do some additions and amendments to them. So under the program, what is AMPS? Okay. 
AMPS is an administrative monetary penalty system, is a program imposed by the municipality to discourage violations of municipal bylaws and to create an efficient and effective way to gain compliance. Administrative penalties are a way to resolve minor parking and bylaw infractions. They've been used by various municipalities uh, since 2016, I believe, when the Municipal Act had that special provision put into it. The Municipal Act states that the amount of an administrative penalty established by a municipality shall not be punitive in nature and shall not exceed the amount reasonably required to promote compliance with the municipal bylaw. Next slide. So we have two different systems. We've used the POA system for prosecutions through the court system, and AMPS allows everything to be done through a municipality for enforcement. AMPS is a very similar process. It's an administrative process, which will be managed by the municipality's building and planning department. Next slide. AMPS is a more effective way. It allows resolution of bylaw matters in a more convenient, approachable, and less intimidating manner. The municipality is able to resolve bylaw infractions in a timely manner, and it reduces congestion in provincial courts. Next slide. Under the AMPS process, there is a penalty notice. And as you can see on the right hand side, um, that's what our penalty notice is going to look like. Um, they're at the printers right now to be printed. And a penalty notice is very much the same as a parking ticket, except that it requires the payment of a penalty instead of a fine. When an officer determines there's a violation of a bylaw, a penalty notice is issued. A person can pay the penalty within 15 days of receiving the penalty notice. Should payment be made after 15 days, a late payment fee is charged or added to the penalty notice and that will be $25. A person can pay the penalty or should the person want to dispute the penalty, they must request a screening. Next slide. So here's a close up of what the actual ticket, not ticket, but the penalty notice will look like. Um, the front of the notice provides the particulars of the bylaw infraction, which the bylaw enforcement officer will fill out. And the back of the penalty notice will be on a yellow uh, shaded paper. And it outlines the procedures for payment, or in case of a dispute, the procedure requesting a screening officer to review the penalty and it's very similar to the look of a parking ticket. Next slide. If a screening review is requested, a screening review will be conducted by in, a, in person or by a virtual meeting. The screening officer of the review will review and look at all the information that's provided from the person that is asking for the penalty to be reviewed. And the screening officer, after review of all the information, can either affirm the penalty, cancel the penalty, reduce the penalty, and a screening officer may also provide additional time to pay a penalty. Next slide. Under a hearing review, a person may request a hearing officer review, which is a third party, and this hearing is conducted as a virtual meeting. And this happens when a person isn't satisfied with the screening officer's decision, so they can request that a third party or the hearing officer review um, their penalty notice. The hearing officer may confirm the screening decision they can cancel the penalty notice. They can reduce the penalty amount or extend the time for payment. 
the decision of the hearing officer is final and binding. Next slide. Associated with the AMPS bylaw are administrative fees, and I believe they're in Schedule A of the AMPS bylaw. And what they involve is a payment for various fees throughout the program. There's a late penalty, late payment fee, there's an adjournment fee, there's an adjudication fee, there's an SF fee, and there's a screening non-appearance fee and a hearing non-appearance fee. Any payment that's owed to the municipality under the AMPS program, the municipality, in addition to any remedy it may have at law, shall be deemed to be unpaid taxes and may be collected in the same manner as taxes. So any penalty notice that goes unpaid and goes through this process and remains unpaid that we can add it to property taxes of the uh, particular property owner. Next slide. Payment of the penalty notice can be made either by mail, in person, or placed in the municipality's 24-hour drop box. Next slide. So I've just outlined uh, a flow chart um, identifying the processes I just have explained. Simply, the penalty notice is issued for a violation of a municipal bylaw. Currently under this program, we're introducing three bylaws. The open air burn and fireworks bylaw, a noise bylaw, and a nuisance bylaw. So once the penalty notice is issued, um, a person has with 15 days in order to pay the penalty. And when a penalty notice is paid, it is not subject to any further review. Anyone who disputes a penalty notice can request a screening review. And this review by a screening officer, if the person doesn't agree with the screening officer decision, can request a hearing. Next slide. And as I mentioned previously, when a review is requested by a hearing officer, the hearing officer will either confirm the screening decision, cancel the penalty notice, could reduce the penalty amount, or extend the time for payment. The decision of the hearing officer, final and binding, and cannot be appealed any further. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So failure to pay the penalty notice, as I indicated, would be added to a tax roll or any other remedy the municipality may have at law. So there's a couple options in order that um, we may undertake in order to have that penalty uh, payment made. And the easiest, if it is a property owner, we could add it to the tax roll. And my last slide. How is the AMP system better? It is better in resolving minor bylaw infractions which could potentially take months in a congested court system. An AMPS program will speed up this process while maintaining an individual's right to re request a review. And this is a far less bureaucratic process in nature, more streamlined, convenient, and citizen friendly. And it is cost effective. The AMPS program is currently set up to administer three municipal bylaws. As I mentioned, the open air burning and fireworks bylaw, a noise bylaw and nuisance bylaw, which are all in before council um, today for adoption. And I anticipate over the next several months, staff will re be reviewing a number of other municipal bylaws to add them to the AMPS program. Therefore, it's being recommended. The council received the report from the planner regarding the administrative monetary penalty system bylaw and implementation. And further that council support the following bylaws which are on today's agenda for approval. The administrative penalty system, AMPS bylaw, hearing officer bylaw, open air burning and fireworks bylaw, noise bylaw, nuisance bylaw, and hearing officer appointments. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. And just before I hand it back over to the mayor, um, council will notice that there are 
escalating fines for repeat offenses for uh, the same infraction of a bylaw. So, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Anne. Anyone on council have any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Cadigan. Here, Mayor Lambshead. Do we have any estimate on the cost for the taxpayers? This this system's going to cost us. We're hiring people, right? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's supposed to be cost recovery. You'll notice there's adjudication fee. And if you look at the hearing officer uh, position, that, and there is a contract that we're proposing with um, Rutherford Prosecutions, there is a fee for half day and a fee for full day hearings. And it's the cost of the program is to pay for that. There is no uh, retainer fee required as that service is needed, we will try to group a number of hearings at one time to make mo most efficient use of the cost of that program. So it's supposed to be self-sufficient. So it's not really intended to um, cost the taxpayer any money. This may, may continue. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so are we incentivizing maximum employees to lay charges to cover their wages? I'm just not sure how we're, we're, we're hiring bylaw enforcement officers as well, right? That's part of this package. Through you, Mr. Mayor, we currently have Maxima as bylaw enforcement officers for the municipality, and we have currently a bylaw enforcement officer, and there are other staff members, such as building inspectors, that can um, enforce bylaws. Okay. It's not working out in my head how this is paying for itself, I guess, and I just got to figure that out. Thanks for trying. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Councillor Brick. Thanks. Uh, through you, Mayor. I think, um, uh, it, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the ma Maxima is, is only, it was sort of a, a patch patchwork uh, temporary like two, hours. Months, yeah. two months uh, process mm -hmm. to give um, our planning uh, time to develop the AMPS program so that AMP or the Maxima contract is going to be revisited uh, whether whether we continue with it or, or we don't is that is that fair to say go ahead thank you and through you that is correct. And the 2023 budget did contain an amount for services like that. So it's just utilizing some of those funds. So once this gets up and running and, and that trial for Maxima is finished, we will come to council with some solutions there. But at this time, the program should pay for itself okay. because there are budgeted funds for that work already. Go ahead, Councilor Brands. Yeah, just uh, more comment than anything else. I'm so happy that we've uh, reached this point. Uh, it's been a long time coming and I think it's going to serve our municipality well. Uh, I just find it interesting that uh, the fines or whatever we call them uh, shouldn't be punitive. All, all fines are punitive. <laughs> Call them penalties. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mary um, Bill, a build on what uh, Councillor Branson just said. A big thanks to staff for, for getting this done. It's a lot of work um, and appreciate your listening to some of the feedback that was provided to you and also making it into a you know, AMM, AMP for dummies, um, which is really helpful to see the flow chart and, and understand it without having to read all the words. So thank you for that. The only comment I have, and it's probably not something you do immediately, but I would certainly like to see an ability to electronically pay your fines. Um, and I suspect maybe that's just a matter of time, which you can comment on, because we do have that for our taxes uh, currently, and some people just aren't here. I mean, if I had to pay, parking fines or speeding tickets or anything like that in person it would never get done <laughs> so, so we need to get to electronic maybe you can comment on that <laughs> would, you, would you like to comment on that through you mr mayor that's something we're working with I think. <laughs> our administration with currently yeah and that was one of my comments was going to be that you know the penalty notice if it's a bylaw infraction and the person doesn't live here mm -hmm. it's difficult to get them to pay that if they 
take some fireworks and set them off and don't even give you the right name and address then you're you're walking away with that but so that's time spent that you get nothing out of them. those are things you have to look at so thank you for all the effort go ahead sorry mr mayor we've tried to cover that mm -hmm. so it doesn't have to be the penalty notice does not have to be given to a property owner that's why in the presentation today i talked about um getting the penalty fees paid through other methods at law. So we worked with our solicitor who reviewed these bylaws and was very pleased with the wording that we had in them. And the officer who is um, issuing the penalty notice is also required to ask for ID. So hopefully the ID will match the person that is getting the penalty notice. So there are some some safeguards in there and there is a fine for obstructing um, the request by the bylaw enforcement officer. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any other? Go ahead. Councilor yeah, Pazzo. it's just another question. So the late fees are $25 no matter what the penalty is? Yes, Through you, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. So if the fee isn't paid within the 15-day period, and paid afterwards, it's just a twenty-five dollar. Is yield. there any escalating late fee? If it would be forty-five days late or sixty days late, would uh, it still be twenty-five dollars? Through you, Mr. Mayor, it's just currently twenty-five dollars. But as we progress through the program, we can make some changes as we go along. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Where I just want to acknowledge uh, Del did ninety-nine point nine percent of the work on this. And she's worked really hard on this. I just want to know how hard she has worked. Well, thank you very yeah. much, Adele. Thank you for the 1%. You must have had some input. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Thank you for getting point. Anything when I'm in <laughs> but thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Adele. Okay, any other questions? Go ahead. Councilor Brown. Yeah, through you, Mayor. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, again, I'll echo everybody's thanks, uh, Adele. And a special thanks for me. And I know I sent you an email, sort of an 11th hour type thing, and you're so gracious with your time and answered, so I appreciate that. A uh, question with the uh, open air burning. Um, is, is, the, is Chief uh, Brockbank, uh, is he gonna be reviewing that? Is, is that the, the bylaw that he is um, looking to review and update? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. Um, when I reached out to the fire chief, he wanted to look at the bylaw um, in detail and look at revamping it, but his timelines weren't till the fall that he's able to do that because this is a busy time of year. And I didn't want to um, not put it in because it's very important with the fire ban, but I did want to share with you that um, we talked about the fine, so we put the new, sorry, penalties in the bylaw, and I did that with his assistance, and we took the bylaw that was written in 2015, and there was two amendments to it, so we put it all into one document, and also noticed that there was no fine under prosecutions under the old bylaw for doing anything when there's a fire ban on. And so we wanted to include that, which we did with this. And I think the fee is like $500 if there's a violation during a fire ban. So we did include that. That's something new, but the chief certainly wants to take a look at it this fall and bring it up to date. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm prepared to make a motion. Councilor Friends, go ahead. A motion to receive Adele's report. Of the report from planner regarding the administrative monetary penalty system bylaw and implementation. Further, the council supports the following bylaw, which are on today's council agenda for approval. Administrative penalty system bylaw, a hearing officers bylaw, open air burning, fireworks bylaw, noise bylaw, nuisance bylaw, and screening of the hearing officers appointments. Okay, hey, thank you very much for that motion. Councillor Friendsham, do I have a seconder for that motion? Deputy Mayor Armstrong? 
for a seconder. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay. We can move on to 10.5 of our agenda, which is finance. We have none today. And then we can move on to 10.6, which is administration. And we have 10.6.1, Rachel Stark, our economic development and marketing coordinator. Rachel, would you like to speak to this item? Thank you, and through you, Mayor Lambshead. Uh, before you is a report regarding a funding opportunity called the Rural Transit Solutions Fund. Staff were approached by Peterborough County and the local cattle group to discuss an ongoing fund by the Government of Canada that supports various rural transportation and zero emission initiatives. A, represent, a representative from Peterborough County, Trent Lakes, Selwyn Township, and Curve Lake attended a virtual meeting to brainstorm potential projects for the grant, both as individuals and partners. This brought forward the idea of a mobility hub, which is essentially a paved parking lot that would provide various resources for shared transportation. This can include, but is not limited to, carpool parking, bicycle racks, EV stations, benches, a shelter, and washrooms. The proposed mobility hub would also support the completion of multiple action items in the economic development, tourism, and recovery strategic plan, including the possibility of extending Selwyn Township's pilot project, the link to Trent Lakes, by using the hub as a bus stop, installing EV stations, and adding public parking signage. It would also provide more accessible public parking for residents and tourists visiting Buckhorn. The recommendation is that council receive the report and further that council direct staff to apply for the Rural Transit Solutions Fund with a proposed project to create a mobility hub in Buckhorn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Is there any questions from council? I'm seeing none. Oh, go, go ahead, Council Braybrook. That's for you, Mayor. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Uh, a question, I have a question and a comment, but I'll reserve my comment. Um, for uh, later on if there's no other questions. So the question uh, I have is, uh, did the municipality uh, uh, participate in a, a transit pilot program in the past and what, what the result was, if you know? And uh, how did this, or how, how would this uh, proposal differ from the initial pilot program? Okay, Through you, more. Marilyn said, sorry, are you referring, I'm not sure if you're referring to this this one Selwyn is doing or something different? Um, I'm not sure whether any anybody on council or whether um, our CAO may have comment. So thank you, Mr. You. I would suggest we come back on that. I do think there was there a was program at some stage really that wasn't highly used, but I would not yeah. want to say too much about it. I, I, I can only comment a little bit on the oh, yeah. one from the Fourth Lakes. Uh, they did a rural transportation and uh, Kinmount was involved, Norland was involved, Cobacomp. The ridership was very low. They were lucky to get one person from Kinmount to, to go on the bus. So they discontinued a good portion of that route. Okay. Any other comments? Go ahead. Sir Bruder. Yeah. So the comment uh, is I, I do like the idea. I do like the, uh, the spirit of it, uh, uh, specifically uh, the part where it says that. Uh, the idea of a mobile, mobility hub uh, is essential, uh, essentially a paved parking lot that would provide various resources for shared transportation. This can include, but is not limited to, carpool parking, bicycle racks, EV stations, benches, a shelter, and washrooms. Uh, and the proposed mobility hub could also serve as a bus stop for the link, should it be extended to Trent Lakes. So it would also provide more parking options for residents and tourists visiting Buckhorn. And the reason why I reread that was uh, it's an opportunity to sort of dovetail this into our um, I guess our looking forward plans as, as far as development and procuring um, uh, key areas uh, of land uh, that could facilitate uh, a parking lot um, and uh, moving forward and, and seeing that it's 2025 I mean I could see how that could be in this this uh, initiative could be incorporated into something that uh, uh, we may consider down down the road. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Braver. Yes, the, the idea of a hub to me is a great idea. I mean, if it's somewhere that people will go, you might actually get some people riding an extended bus line. I think there was some questions at one of our town hall meetings about that very thing. 
and, and you know, we're looking to the future, we're not looking at the past. The past was very poorly attended, I think. So maybe if we do some projects and advertise it properly, we might be able to get some riderships. It's a great idea, and I fully support trying to get the grant. But Councilor Francis, I, I, I'm certainly in favor of this as well. But I, I know when I was campaigning, uh, different areas within municipality want rides to different locations. The area in Buckhorn wanted uh, a bus service to Peterborough. The area around Novice Creek wanted a bus service to Lindsay. So it, it's very difficult in the municipality like we are in, but I do support the initiative because as he said, it may work in the future. It may not have worked in the past, but we're in different times now. Go ahead, Councilor. Just add to that through your mayor. Uh, yeah, and I think my, my, my vision was seeing this as part of a a, a bigger plan yep um because in order to like you're not going to pave a parking lot just to have a bus go through it um, no. you would in order to attract more people to the municipality and in, in our uh, in our uh, official plan and strategic plan we want to become a four season uh tourist mm -hmm. attraction so mm -hmm. if we did have something on a property that also is paved <laughs> that would have a bus loop, yeah. but it's a destination. It's not just a bus stop for somebody to come yeah. and then hop on and travel somewhere. It's it's a destination to come to Trent Lakes, whether it be Buckhorn, uh, it being the most uh, concentrated area or, or elsewhere if, if anybody desired it and it, and it was feasible and, and would benefit the municipality. Yeah. So mm -hmm. more of a bigger, bigger, Sort of plan. Yeah. Okay. Anybody prepared to make a motion? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I don't know whether I'm ready to make a motion. No, but if you have a comment, I'm sorry. I, I do have a comment echoing what Councillor Braybrook said through you, Mayor. Uh, I I agree that if we get public service to Buckhorn, it would be a great start. And I dream about the day when it could go to Flynn's or maybe even mm -hmm. to Ketchikoma. Mm -hmm. Or into Kinmount or Bob yeah. Kinmount or <laughs> Burley Falls. We're, we're <laughs> fairly spread out. So. That's excellent. Okay. Anyone is anyone? Uh, I, I'm going to make a motion to, to receive the report from and support the report from our uh, okay. from Stark as recommended. So as recommended. Direct staff. Okay. Yep. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion, Councillor Cadigan, for a seconder? Do you have a comment before we vote? I have a question. Yeah, any conversation? Yes. Councillor yes. Braver, go ahead. Through you, Mayor. Um, I, I'm not clear on on what the, uh, I know we've made a motion, but what are we agreeing to? Like if we, if, if we agree to trying to get a piece of the 3 million um, come 2025, um, I guess what are we, we're just concentrating on, you know, uh, what was mentioned here, like the parking lot and that sort of thing. I guess I'm not, if if we were challenged on, well, what are you gonna do with the money? You know, if the, if the possibility did come up and we want it, uh, you know, what's our plan? Like if we just present this plan as bike racks and a parking lot, and, and we still need land, we need, still need somewhere to, to do it. So I don't know whether we're applying for something that we're, we're not really prepared for. Uh, so I, I don't know, that's just my, Questions. If we got three million, I think we could do all of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you'll find we get a very small slice of the pie there, and it might be one bike rack somewhere. Or, but you never know. If you don't apply, you won't get it. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank well you. worth applying. Okay. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. As recommended. Okay, we can move on now to 10.6.2 of our agenda, which is Donna Taggart, our CEO of Treasure, our annual Great Payers Community Association meeting feedback. Go ahead, Donna. Thank you, and through you. So before you is a staff report on the public feedback received regarding the annual Rate Payer Community Association meeting. Uh, this report was prepared in response to council direction provided at the June 6, 2023 meeting. So staff did send out a survey We've attached that for you. And we requested feedback from the public by July 11. So the survey included an opportunity for respondents to provide opinions and comments. 
and more clearly define the objective of the meeting. So the survey was sent out through social media, through the Cottage Association email list, through the news section on the municipality's website, and through um, the portal for all those subscribed to the web website. So there were seven responses received, and staff have summarized those responses in the report for Council. So today, staff are looking for support uh, to schedule a 2023 ratepayer meeting for September 16, 2023 to start at 10 a.m. with future meetings to occur annually on the second Saturday in July. So should Council support a meeting in September, staff are looking for direction from Council as to the format of the meeting and it is staff's recommendation that Council consider an informal town hall style meeting similar to what Selwyn do, which would be attended by all of council, allowing for an opportunity for a back and forth with the rate pairs, as long as there are no resolutions or decisions made. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Okay. Do we have any <laughs> questions from council? See, go ahead, Councillor Graber. Um, I'd like to make a motion to uh, to receive the report and, and direct staff on the two uh, items uh, mentioned. And I would also like to add, a, I don't know whether it's a friendly amendment or an addition to. Well, you're making a motion, so you can make the motion however way you'd like. All right. Then. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to make an amendment to um, to this motion. Um, uh, we'll keep the uh, the council receive the report. Um, and, and also uh, we'll, we'll keep the three uh, items. And to add uh, and further that staff, prior to the annual special council meeting, receive input from the uh, Cavendish Community Ratepayers Association Inc. executive, who is acting as central spokesperson for 22 Municipal Cottage and Community Association executives and any other associations uh, summarizing the topics of importance to these cottage and community organizations and that staff present on topics identified by the comp or the cottage and community organization executives and further that following the special council meeting a second informal meeting be conducted with the executives of the associations and the mayor and deputy mayor with consideration being given to holding the second meeting at the trent lakes fire hall with or without a facilitator, which will be at the discretion of the mayor. Uh, I do have comments, but we can go through this first. Okay, that's a, that's a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. Okay, now any conversation? Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Yeah, thanks for mentioning. Just a wordsmithing thing. I'm not sure that CCRAI is acting as a spokesperson. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are. But have they been designated as a spokesperson by the others? So perhaps we could just strike that from the motion. That's fine. And I, I have a comment to that, but sure. And I think you said, said all organizations will comment. Yeah. Yeah. All, yes, not, yeah, not yeah. just yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's comments. We can probably get to whittle down to 25 questions. It, just a sorry for the clarification and that your recommendation following the first three is just focused on the September 16th meeting yes for this year yes yep, yep. so we yep. as a trial yep yes okay go ahead Councilor just David. a further comment uh, I did receive um, uh, emails also from uh, a couple of association reps um, voicing their opinion that they they really didn't want to uh, sort of join the group but that doesn't preclude them from participating in, in any other uh, issues that they may have status quo, uh, you know, carrying on as, as, as per usual. But I think it's, uh, I want to thank uh, Gary Jarose for taking initiative and, and also um, making the effort to, to, in fact, reach out to 25 of the associations um, and having buy-in, so to speak, uh, from 22 associations. And when I look at it uh, as 22 associations, that's not 22 people, it's 22 associations. So, so that speaks to a, a larger portion of our uh, constituents and residents. So it's good that, uh, that uh, I mean, it just, it promotes transparency, you know, access, accessibility to council. Uh, and the new initiative uh, is to generate and encourage 
better resident uh, involvement or participation in future surveys and input and it improves our communication strategies and, and I know it's a, it's it's fluid and we're always going to be looking for ways to improve. Uh, also to add that the town halls uh, that, that are ongoing now, they provide a general conversation uh, for people, um, uh, whereas I believe this initiative is more specific and, and pointed, which will allow actions to be generated and clear direction uh, given to staff through council. Uh, hopefully, that's that's the hopes. Uh, and um, it just depends on what part of that meeting you're talking about. If it's an informal kind of a town hall with all of council, similar to to ourselves, so, we cannot be giving direction without it being a public meeting. So we right. have to be very cautious how you proceed. Yeah. With the procedures, am I not correct? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Here comes um, the pen job. <laughs> no pen job. Um, the uh, meeting is required to be open, which means that the public have the opportunity to view the proceedings of the meeting, um, provided there's proper notice. Decisions are not restricted from being made. Um, However, if we're um, if staff or council are unclear on what topics or um, decisions will be made, we just have to be cautious that we're giving providing sufficient public notice. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Go ahead, council. Just Great. a further comment and clarification for me as well. So the secondary uh, meeting, which which would be the informal meeting with with the mayor and deputy mayor. Um, if there are any actions that do come out of that, that would have to be brought to council. So there would be a, some sort of process that would have to take place that if, if there were some suggestions that you may deem viable, then that would have to go through a process to, to come to council and, and be open to the public. I think that's exactly what we're doing with our town halls. Mm -hmm. This will be more an executive of the association interaction and the town halls are mostly individuals coming with their, what they would like, what they see, what they don't like. And there is a lot of people that like things, so it's nice to hear that. And, and when we are done some of our town halls, I think the Deputy Mayor and I will bring a report to Council and staff so that we can maybe address some of the little wee issues that we have. So, yeah. okay. so we have a mover, we have a seconder, we've had conversation. Do we want more conversation? I request a report to vote. Okay. <clears throat> Any other conversation? No call for. I can't call for a vote. That's up to you. All right, uh, Councillor. Can I? Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm struggling with something, and I don't know how to articulate it. <laughs> okay. um, I'm wondering if we could break them out, or should break them out into two motions because the special meeting i have no problem with that if they think yeah. you know yeah, if there's too. a yeah. thought that that We're here to be will you know produce some kinds of results that town halls or other meetings can't you know <laughs> let's open it up and see what happens but it's not a council meeting and it's not under council jurisdiction it's basically an informal meeting that you and i would choose to agree to have with the association executives so i'm wondering if that should be a separate motion because it's really not a council decision i'm not articulating it <clears throat> along with not thinking about it very clearly i guess i'm not articulating it very well does anybody understand what i'm trying to say <laughs> I, i'm okay with it being one motion i just yeah, it, it's it, we're, this is a trial right yeah if we don't get this right we can change it it's oh, yeah. something that we need to i, I just want to make a comment i doubt very much any kind of uh, motion would ever be struck at that kind of meeting i believe any motion that 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 should be brought back to council from any kind of public meeting and personally i want to have staff assist with that well, that's, yep. that's what this is about we can bring get some ideas and we can have our staff yep. look at them ideas and give us some solutions exactly this is what we are all here to work together to accomplish yep. some good solutions to anything that's yep. that's that's wrong or right i mean we, this we're here to do it together so yeah Withdrawn. Okay, withdrawn. All right. I will call for the vote. Muddle thinking withdrawn. All in favor. 
Councillor. Oh, no, I can't. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. That happened. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Franzen, are you in favor? Yes. Uh, Mayor Lampet? Yes. Deputy Mayor Armstrong? Yes. Councillor Brabo? Yes. Councillor Cadigan? Yes. That motion is carried. Thank you. Our clerk, Jesse Clark. You're running the meeting for me. <laughs> we will move on now to section 10.7, which is corporate services. We can go to 10.7.1 and Bianca Dragicevic, our deputy clerk, can you please speak to 10.7.1? She fell asleep. Didn't she? <laughs> She was having mic issues before. Um, so on behalf of Bianca, there is the council expenses for June and the remainder of April and May um, for council's uh, review and approval. Okay, we all had a chance to peruse that. I would entertain a motion. Councillor Cadigan. I move we pay council expenses. Okay. Do I have a second for that motion? Yep. Councillor Graber, for a second. Any other conversation? See none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Okay. Thank you, Bianca slash Jesse. Okay, we can move on to item 10.7.2 of our agenda, which is Jesse Clark, our Director of Corporate Services. Clerk, can you please speak to this file? Thank you. Through you, Mayor Lambspad, at the May 2nd, 2023 Council meeting, Council approved the stop up closure and sale. Um, of part one on the attached plan in exchange uh, for Harold Drew relinquishing back to the municipality the lands shown as parts three and four um, in order to maintain public access to the water. The subject road allowance will serve as a lot addition and merge with the applicant's lands. The request today is to receive the report, authorize the transfer of the portion of the unopened road allowance, approve the purchase price of $8,700 plus HST for the sale of the unopened road allowance, and authorize the mayor and clerk to execute any documents that may be necessary to affect the sale of the subject property. There's also a bylaw on today's agenda to stop up, close, and transfer this portion of unopened road allowance. Okay, thank you very much, Jesse. Do you have any comments or questions? No. Anyone prepared to make a motion? Motion to approve. As recommended. As recommended. Okay. We have a motion. Do I have a seconder for that motion? The Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? I'm seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. Thank you very much. We can move on to item 11 of our agenda, which is correspondence for information. We can receive them all at once, or we can receive any ones that want to be pulled out to be popular. Entirely at Council's discretion. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Uh, I make a motion to receive all of these correspondence <coughs> under item 11. Okay, do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Braver for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Thank you very much. We can move on to item 12 of our agenda, which is correspondence for action. We can receive them all in one motion, or we can receive anyone or talk about anyone you'd like. Discretion. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would oh, make yes. a motion to support the request by Mad for advertising. I think we've done that in the past, and I um, believe we have room in our advertising budget uh, to support the three hundred ninety-nine dollar advertisement requested. We do have. Okay, thank you very much, Donna Taggart, our CAO Treasurer. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Franzen for a seconder. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We move on to 12.2 or any other ones we would like. We can... Go ahead, Councillor Franzen. I, I think we've dealt with 12.2 before, but I would still like to support that. I think we have to in, uh, improve our the municipal. <coughs> There's actually some enforcement these councillors are. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Deputy Mayor Armstrong, go ahead. Is that for a seconder? Any other conversation? 
Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. We have 12.3 and 12.4. We can do them together or separately, whatever you choose. Go ahead, Councilor. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to receive both 12.3 and 12.4. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Seconded. Oh, all right. Councilor Cadigan for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. We can move on to 12.3 and 13.1 of our agenda, which is a bylaw amended memorandum. I think Justice Clark, our clerk, will speak for this file. Thank you for you, Mayor Lambstead. There are two bylaws on today's agenda that didn't have a corresponding staff report or public meeting. The first is bylaw B202359, which is to appoint an additional staff member of maxima protection as a bylaw enforcement officer. And bylaw B202360 is a bylaw to appoint Amber Novak as a deputy clerk. Okay, thank you very much. We can go to item 13.2 of our agenda, which is stop of controls and unopened road allowance. Is anyone prepared to make a motion? Deputy Councillor Franzen for a mover. Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. All in favor? That motion is carried. We can move on to our section 13.3, which is our administrative monetary penalty system. Unless council wants to take this all in one motion, this whole, yep. we can do that because there's several. Yep. Okay, and that's good. That is at your discretion. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor Armstrong. So, uh, so I'd like to make a motion to approve 13.3 through 13.8, which are all related to the AMP uh, and the new bylaws. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. We can move on to 13.9, which is a zoning bylaw amendment for reaching. Anyone prepared to make a motion? Go ahead, Councillor Cad. Cadigan for a mover. I move that we support recommendations from staff. Okay. Let's approve it. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Braber for a seconder. All in favor? <laughs> that motion is here. And we can turn to 13.10, which is the removal of the hold at 1177 Lakers Road. Do I Councillor? Motion to approve. Deputy Mayor Armstrong. Go. And do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Braber for a seconder. Any conversation? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We can move on to 13.11 on our agenda, which is the appointment of our bylaw enforcement officer. Anyone prepared to make a motion? I see Councillor Franzen for a move. And Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a seconder. Any conversations? I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay, we can move on to item 13.2. One, two of our agenda. I think we ordered a desk. We went back upstairs. This is to appoint Amber Novak as our deputy clerk. Anyone prepared to make that motion? Okay. Councillor Braybrook for a mover. Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. Any conversation? Seeing none. All in favor? Move on to item four. That motion is carried. We can move on to item 14 of our agenda, which is business rising of a previous meeting. 14.1, Jesse Clark, our Director of Corporate Services Clerk. Could you speak to that item? Thank you. Through you, Mayor Lambshead. Staff originally presented this report to Council at their June 6th regular meeting. Council deferred the report to today's meeting. To summarize, staff reviewed the committee and board policy, recommendations from the municipality's strategic plans and guiding documents, inputs from the previous committees, being the uh, Park Recreation and Culture Advisory Committee and Economic Development Advisory Committee, and opportunities to optimize the structure and function, including the mandate, flow of information, composition, and member recruitment, engagement, and retention. Staff have presented three options for council uh, being one, working groups only, no advisory committees, two, one advisory committee being a consolidation of EDAC and PRCAC, and three, multiple advisory committees at the discretion of council. Staff are looking for direction from council on which option to proceed with, 
and have drafted recommendations based on each of these options. Okay, any conversation, any questions, any comments from Council? Go ahead, Councilor Friend. I, I support option three. I, I support the, the two committees that we had, and plus environmental committee slash uh, climate change. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Why? Why? <laughs> Why? I think it's beneficial to the <laughs> municipality. I think the uh, committees did an awful lot of work over the last four years in the previous council. I, I think it's about time that we had an environmental slash climate change committee. A lot of municipalities are doing much more than we are uh, co combating climate change and uh, working towards a better environment. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you, Mayor Lancer. Um, I can, I, my set, thought about this a lot. I think what we need for the economic development, recovery, and tourism strategy and for our open spaces strategic plan is more like a steering committee. The implementation plan is pretty clear on who should do what and when, and a lot of the responsibility falls on our staff to look at the implementation plan. I don't want to create a new steering committee. I think the steering committee is us. And I think the only way we can be effective as a steering committee and make sure it gets implemented is if we have periodic progress reports and we stay on top of it and make sure it's implemented. So at least for this year, I'm inclined to say, let's not put in place an economic development Committee. They did some great work in the past. They provided some terrific input for the strategic plan. But now that we have it, I think it's a handoff to staff and somebody needs to monitor, oversee, and manage that. And I think at least the first year, that's council. As we get to the second year, probably different. We probably will need a trails committee uh, and so forth. But so I'm, I'm leaning against those two. I absolutely agree we could benefit from outside expertise uh, and energy on climate change and environment. So I think that would be a terrific idea for a new advisory committee. I think we lack that and we could use it and it would put focus on it, which we've said is one of our strategic priorities. The other possible one would be heritage, um, natural and cultural, because again, we have one expert on staff, but without the capacity to deal with it, and so that would provide us the capacity and the expertise and the focus that we probably should be placing on that. So I would see us, maybe stage thing, but I would see us supporting uh, an environmental action, environmental climate change advisory committee with experts on it, as well as a heritage committee with experts on it for advice. And then I would, um, I would wait for this year until we see, and I would almost suggest a progress report in November around budget time so we can see what's been done on those implementation plans. Do we need additional help? Um, but at this point, I'm not sure it needs an advisory committee. I think it needs um, oversight of the implementation plan. So that's my speech. <laughs> Sorry to go so long, but. Uh, Any other comments? Through you, Mayor, it's just like to respond. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about the environmental uh, slash climate change committee. Uh, I, I talked when I uh, took my seat at KRCA to Mark uh, Markowski and uh, the, our previous climate change committee had a member that was uh, a staff member from the Quartha Conservation Authority and he volunteered to uh, to let one of his staff sit on a committee. So so that would be some some environmental expertise. And uh, when we advertise for members for that committee, we should ask that they uh, it would be uh, helpful if they had a scientific background. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in our communities that have uh, scientific. Uh, expertise and that's my speech 
if I can just build on that, I think the recommendation here is going to be to have staff go away and build the terms of reference for whatever committees yeah, we yeah, recommend. Right. Yeah. And I think we should scrutinize them very carefully for exactly that reason, yeah. uh, Councilor Friends, and just make sure that our request is going out to get members who bring, you know, expertise, knowledge, uh, and resources to it. Yeah. Very important. Yeah, Councilor Graber. Just to build off that as well. Uh, <laughs> Just uh, when uh, Deputy Mayor Armstrong was mentioning uh, experts and whatnot, I just I, I want to see it to be balanced. Um, me coming from my previous uh, life in, in policing, uh, if you're in court, you bring an expert. That's for one side. You bring an expert for another side. They're both equally trained and equally mm -hmm. qualified, but they're bringing different opinions so i just like to see it balanced because people have to live in the municipality and it's it, it just seems that it's it, and i agree there's climate change that's just natural that's just the world uh and our environment we look after it uh as we do over the just given our geography and all the work that uh, mr learden does as well uh and his organization and all the other organizations i just want to be careful that you know, people have to live here as well, and they have to heat their homes. They have to. So I think uh, I think it's just a balance, striking a balance, and getting a uh, you know a commonsensical uh, conclusion and that sort of thing. Okay, go ahead. I'd just like to respond. It it's not that I would uh, require that they have a science background, but it it, it would uh, it would be beneficial to the committee if they did. And. Uh, uh, I would hope that we could gear towards people that were qualified in uh, making recommendations that would help us uh, combat climate change. Yeah, and through your merit, just to, to respond to that, uh, absolutely, I, I agree. However, it, we should, if we're going to compose the committees, there should be a balance of yep. no, expertise. I, I agree, I agree. Whether it's just, it's not just one one voice yep. being trumpet it out and yep. it should be a, a balance and then, and then you'll get a, a fruitful discussion within those committees and yep. come out with commonsensical uh, presentations to council and, yep. and that sort of thing. And I must agree that that's, it's it's about having a variety of people on the committee because you might only get one perspective and we need all the perspectives. We don't, we don't need one perspective. And I, I'm okay with what we had previously. I, I didn't mind the Parks and Recreation and Culture Advisory Committee or EDAC because they have a different lens on things. I know we've done a lot of work and there's a lot of reports and there's master plans and things that are being developed by a lot by staff, which is great, but that's going to keep staff busy. And what about the new ideas? What about all of that coming in the future? There's there's still more things coming. Environmental committee, I'm, regardless of its composition, I think it's important. We really don't have anything going on right now. And for me, a heritage maybe not a, a committee, but a working group, like something that you can be very specific. We do have some expertise on our own staff that I, I think we could utilize. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Not, not, not just Adele, I mean, you're there too. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, there's lots of opportunity here to, to make Trent Lakes the best it can be, and I think that's what this is about. And I think some of these committees have tried their very best to do that. I would support having some committees and advisory groups not just one or the other, a combination of both, but, which is like option three, I think it was. That's my opinion. Any other comments? Go ahead, Yeah, through you, Mayor. Uh, I agree with uh, your comments, Mayor, and I also agree with uh, Deputy uh, Mayor Armstrong's comments as far as uh, committees. I, I'm I'm in favor of uh, uh, having the uh, Economic Development Committee and the PRCAC, whether it be a uh, hybrid of it uh, but I do agree that like we've bitten off quite a bit uh, mm -hmm. for this term being the open spaces master plan and we have a lot of uh, oars in the water so to speak uh, and, and it may be a good idea to you know be in favor of having the committees reconstituting them uh, with some adjustments uh, but waiting that let, let, let us exhale and, and eat what we have on our plate and, and plan uh, as we move on for, for next year and, and that sort of thing. So, so I, I, is there a hybrid between two and three or one? <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking at the calendar and saying it's July 11th. Yeah. 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 That, that, that through you, Mayor, I'd like to make that comment. 
I, I doubt that we would have the committees constituted till 2024 anyway. By the time we get reports, by the time we advertise uh, for people to join these committees, we would be into November, December. We would have Mayor Armstrong. Just another consideration to you, Mayor Lamb said, um, the pool of people. <laughs> we have a very difficult time getting no, no. enough applicants just to fill the positions, much less people that have the kinds of backgrounds and experience and expertise that we would like to have. So four committees is an awful lot. So I'm kind of liking Councillor Braybrook's suggestion, which is, you know, constitute two in the short term, mm -hmm. which you know my preference would be would be new where we need outside expertise, heritage and environmental climate change. And let's just take a pause, see how that recruitment goes, how that constitution goes. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we get progress reports from our staff on all of the different plans in say November and we look at our budget, then let's revisit uh, reconstituting ECDEV and NPR uh, CAC. We'll have a better idea what we want them to do uh, and their, their mandate at that time. So I guess I'll make a motion that yep. we we do it that we approve proceeding with approve that staff proceed with drafting up the necessary uh, work to support <laughs> the creation of two new committees, the Heritage Committee and the Environmental and Climate Change Committee, and that we table for now um, creating or recreating the Economic uh, Development Committee and the PRCAC Committee uh, to be brought back to Council January, February next year, just so we don't lose it. Something like that. Open to open to wordsmithing. <laughs> I'll second the motion. Go ahead. Councilman. Just uh, through you, Mayor, uh, to dovetail on uh, Deputy Armstrong's comments. Uh, as far as, and I agree with, uh, and I know there are several constituents that uh, I've had conversations with. Uh, it's it's not necessarily just uh, having a committee. It's it's how you populate the committee and the expertise. And 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 I agree with that. And, and if if there's if we're looking for five people for economic development and five and five, and if we only get applicants through three and three, and and they really don't uh, from their background, they're not going to really uh, you know benefit the municipality through their experience. Then you know if we're not getting the people, then you know we don't just uh, enact a committee for the sake of enacting a committee and just populating for the sake of having it. If we don't have the expertise, um, then then we we keep that pause on, and and keep the uh, I guess the communication to the public that we are looking for people, so we could slowly populate it. Now we have two people for economic development that are fantastic. We're looking for three more, and we pause it until we have that. And once we have that, I mean, we have to let that drive. It. I, I would rather see the experience drive the. Because if we just populate it with whomever, then it's just it's just a committee that's sitting for four years, and and not not to say that uh, you know the value of the people coming into the committees, but I think it should be populated uh, with with qualified people, uh, and that that just makes sense to me. So. Any other comments? I see none. So we're talking just two new committees, no EDAC and no Parks, Recreation, Culture, no hybrid of the two for the yeah. okay. Just wanted to make sure I got something straight in my head. Okay, any other conversation? I will call for the vote. All in favor? Motion was carried. Okay, we can move on to item 15 of our agenda, which is notice of motion. Seeing so none on our agenda, we can move on to item 16, which is information items. Go ahead, Jesse Clark or Kirk. I asked Steve Brockbank that wanted to provide an update on the burn ban. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Chief Brockbank, would you care to speak? 
Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Through you uh, to Council, as of 3 o'clock this afternoon, the Ministry has decided to lift their fire restrictions. So um, we're going we're gonna to proceed. <laughs> yeah, lots of notice. Uh, they're going to lift it by 4 p.m. today. Um, <laughs> Get that to so, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we're going to proceed with our social media and website update this afternoon, and we'll continue to uh, update the signage and stuff tomorrow. So just for information purposes. Thank you very much, Frogbank. I'm looking Where? out the window and hoping we don't have a lightning strike. Where? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the update. That's great news for most of our rate payers. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Any other information items? Just a question. Yeah, for yeah, Chief Robert, that's for all of Trent Lakes, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, province wide? Yeah, just yeah, that was me. Yeah, there's um there's uh, all the restricted areas look like they're lifting them. I can't speak to the Quebec and stuff like that, but yeah, there's um there's quite a slew of numbers um in the RFZ that they're lifting. Um but to be honest, it's uh, it's our municipalities being lifted, Duro Dummer, such so our neighbors and the park will also be lifting theirs um, on social media today and signage will be changed tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you very much for the update. Any other comments? Seeing none, we can move on to item 17 of our agenda, which is our closed meeting. 17.1, we are going into closed for the Ontario Municipal Act, section 239.2, to discuss F advice that is subject to solicitor client privileges including communications necessary for that purpose and legal opinion so i would need a motion to go into close and make this motion on the academy deputy mayor armstrong all in favor that motion is carried we are going into close Okay, we can move on to section 17.2, which is rise from close meeting. We, I would need a motion to that effect. Deputy Mayor Armstrong for a mover and Councillor Cadigan for a seconder. All in favor? That motion has carried. We are back in regular meeting. Okay, section 18 is business arising out of our closed session meeting. We can adopt the minutes of our previous meeting as is section 18.1. Prepare to make a motion. Except Councillor Cadigan for a mover to adopt the minutes. Councillor Franzen for a seconder. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. We move on to 19 of our agenda, which is the adoption of the confirming bylaw. Anyone prepared to make a motion? The Deputy Mayor Armstrong for the adoption. Councillor Braver for a seconder. Any conversation? Yeah. None. I will call for the vote. All in favor? That motion is carried. Okay, we can move on to item 20 of the agenda, which is adjournment. Would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? No, we're staying here all day. Sure. Councillor Braybrock for a mover. Councillor Franzen for a seconder. Sure. I'll, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? That motion has carried. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, all of staff. Thank you, all of council.